Chapter 3. The Subjective Conditions for Healing and Health 1. The Will to be Healed As St. Simeon the New Theologian notes, baptism does not suffice in itself for our salvation. The same can be said of the other sacraments and of all the sacraments combined. The man receiving them becomes, in fact, a new creature, conformed to Christ, only on condition that he open up his entire being to the grace given him by the Spirit, and that he direct all his faculties and his entire life toward God. In other words, the objective conditions of our healing and deification constituted by the holy sacraments must be accompanied by the subjective conditions, which are free will and our personal and voluntary cooperation. As St. Nicholas Cabasilas notes, the sacraments confer on us the life in Christ, but with certain participation on man's part. He says further, quote, the life in Christ dwells in a cooperation of the divine, depending properly on God, and of the human, to wit, our good will, our effort, and our zeal. Respectful of man's freedom, God cannot force his grace on him, nor transform him without man's choosing and wanting this grace with all his being. He cannot substitute himself for man and act in his place. St. Macarius the Great writes, quote, Man has by nature the power of taking pains, and this is what the scripture demands. It charges, therefore, that a man should first consider, and that when he has considered, he should love, and should his will to take pains. But to have the mind influenced, or to endure the labor, or to accomplish the work, this the grace of the Lord bestows on the man who has willed and believed. Man's will, therefore, is like a material support. Where the will is not present, even God himself does nothing, though he could because of man's freedom. The effectual working of God depends upon the will of man. End of quote from his homilies. In other words, even though healing and salvation have their source in Christ alone and are bestowed on us only within the church and through the Holy Spirit, this healing and salvation presupposes man's assent and even his active cooperation. As St. Macarius the Great says, they require that man keep his own will in harmony with grace that come about through a synergy of the divine grace and human effort. The same saint says elsewhere that if the soul does not cooperate with the grace of the Spirit which is it with her, then she is deprived of her honors and dis with disgrace and in indignity and banished from life as being unprofitable and unfit for the fellowship of the heavenly King. In all the sacraments, and especially in baptism, God gives his grace to man without any restrictions. But man's task is not only to preserve this grace, but furthermore to make it his own to assimilate it and cause it to bear fruit within him. This he does by opening himself up to God's grace, allowing himself to be penetrated and transformed by it, by submitting to it, and by bringing his entire being and existence into accord with it. With regard to baptism, St. Daudokos of Photiki observes, quote, We are reborn through water, so that if we commit ourselves totally to God, we are immediately purified in soul and body. On the other hand, man must strive to preserve the grace he has received. Thus, St. Nicholas Cabasilas writes, quote, From the very beginning, it depends on the Savior's hand alone that this life should come into being. Once it has been established, its preservation, our continuance in life, depends on our own efforts. So, in order that we may not destroy the grace that we have received, but preserve it to the end, there is need of something human, of endeavor on our part. End of quote. This does not mean that the grace of baptism can be taken away from man. It remains in the person who has received it, regardless of what he becomes. As St. Seraphim of Serov particularly stresses, but man can lose this grace. St. Macarius the Great thus explains, How is it written, Quench not the Spirit? 1 Thessalonians 5.19 The Spirit cannot be quenched, but is always light. But you, if you are careless and do not with your own will respond, are yourself quenched and lose the Spirit. 
End of quote. On the other hand, man must strive to develop grace. This does not mean that grace is attributed to man and that it has only been given to him in part. He receives the fullness of grace at baptism, but it remains for him to develop himself in it by and in conformity with this grace. St. Gregory of Nyssa thus points out that, quote, the transformation of our life which is wrought by rebirth cannot be a transformation if nothing changes in our life. Going so far as to say that if the life following initiation does not differ from that which preceded it, if in our whole being and our whole life we do not encounter or endeavor to be in conformity with the image of God that is restored in us, then in that case the water of baptism is simply water. To put it in another way, what man is potentially in his nature by grace, he must also become personally and actively by his free will in all his life and being. For, as St. Gregory of Nyssa warns, that which you all have not become, you are not. And St. Diodocus of Photiki spells out in detail that if the first of the gifts bestowed by the grace of baptism is immediate restoration of the image of God, the second gift, the likeness of God, requires our cooperation. Of all the fathers, St. Mark the ascetic is without doubt the one who has most clearly and strongly emphasized all this, especially in his treatise on baptism. He insists on the fact that holy baptism is perfect. Man receives in it the perfect grace of the Spirit, that of a complete purification, a total liberation, and a full sanctification. If having been baptized, we continue to sin, to live in the passions, to suffer the effects of evil, and to be spiritually ill, this is in no way due to our continuing to suffer from the consequences of the original sin, since we have been cleansed of this, nor is it due to being imposed on us by the devil, since we have been freed from his tyranny. This can only be attributed to our negligence and falls under the purview of our responsibility alone. The grace we have received is perfect. We are the ones who show ourselves to be imperfect in relation to this grace. The grace we possess in full is only manifested and revealed as far as our faith, our hope, and in general, our keeping of the commandments permit. God gives us the fullness of his grace at baptism. It remains in us, but does not force itself on us. Respectful of our freedom, God does not compel us to experience the effects of grace. Man is perfectly purified through baptism, but he remains free to sin, and if he does sin, he defiles himself as before. It is thus necessary that man fight so as not to turn back and fall again into the sin and the passions. Every sin committed after baptism is due not to the imperfection of baptism, but rather to our lack of faith and our negligence in keeping the commandments. We must only blame ourselves for our faults, not Adam and not Satan, for we have been completely freed through baptism from the predisposition to evil inherited from the ancestral sin and from every tyrannical constraint operated by the devil. Full freedom lies at our disposal, and the sins we commit after baptism are due only to the misuse of this freedom. We continue to be tempted after baptism. We cannot prevent this, since it comes from the devil, and we are in no way responsible for it. But it is our responsibility to reject these suggestions. We are totally free when faced with temptation, Baptism has given us the power to resist the tempter victoriously. Nothing of what we reject can harm or abide in us. If we assent to the temptations, it is because we really want to do so, and we do so in complete freedom. Sin only acts in us anew because we have begun to love it. And this is due only to our negligence. Only two causes lie at the root of the activity of evil that persists in us the abandoning of the commandments, and the wicked deeds voluntarily committed after baptism. By the grace of baptism, it is thus possible to avoid evil entirely. We have already acquired that ability. But the preservation of the purity granted to us requires that we resist temptations and that we actively keep the commandments in an attitude of faith and hope. 
the manifestation of sanctifying and deifying grace given to us fully but mystically in baptism likewise requires our effort. This grace is disclosed, effectively revealed, and causes its effects to be felt only to the degree of our faith, our hope, and our keeping of the commandments. Thus, although this grace cannot grow in us, for it is perfect, lacking nothing that could be added by our own efforts, we can grow in grace. The virtues we shall be able to acquire will be put will be but the progressive revelation of this baptismal grace in relation to the, our keeping of the commandments. The same thing can be said regarding the Eucharist. Although it gives Christ himself fully to the baptized person and diffuses him throughout all the members of man's body and all the faculties of his soul, it does not act automatically and somehow magically. Here too, God does not force man, and the sacrament's action is relative to the spiritual aptitude of the person receiving it. In itself, the Eucharist possesses power, but this power is only exercised if the communicant is disposed to receiving the sacrament appropriately. The prayers before communion even stress that he who communes unworthily eats and drinks damnation to himself. These same prayers, as well as those that follow communion, invite the Christian to open his entire being to him whom he receives, to show himself fully receptive to God's therapeutic and sanctifying action, and to act in such a way as to assimilate to himself the gift that has been received. Like the grace of baptism, the grace of the Eucharist is also given in full to all communicants, but manifests itself in them in diverse manners in proportion to the quality of their receptivity and their keeping of the commandments. As St. Nicholas Cabasilas notes, this explains how, quote, there are some who preserve the signs of illness and the scars of old wounds if they have not sufficiently taken care of themselves, and if their preparation has not been commensurate with the remedy's vigor, end of quote. One can say the same of the rest of the sacraments. In a general way, St. Maximus writes, each of us possesses the manifest energy of the Spirit in proportion to the faith that is in him. Each person is thus the steward of his own grace. And of quote, questions to Thalassius. We can say then with St. John Chrysostom, after God's grace, everything depends on us and our application. From his baptismal catechesis. The existence of an almighty physician, capable of healing everything, does not in itself suffice for man to be freed from his ills ipso facto. One must still turn to him for help. But before that, one must desire to regain one's health. In order to obtain from Christ the healing of illnesses, man must first of all want to be healed. He must also turn to God and call upon him with all his might. For as St. John Chrysostom notes, quote, the divine physician does not heal us against our will. Theodore of Cyprus likewise writes, Quote, the physician of souls does not pressure those who do not wish to profit from his treatment. From his therapy of Hellenic illnesses. Above all, it is also indispensable for man not to refuse to think of his state and to see his illnesses. And if he is aware of them, not to refuse to cry out to him who can cure them, or at least not neglect to do this. St. John Cashin writes, quote from his conferences, In truth, curative remedies cannot be lacking to those who look for healing from that most true physician of souls. This is especially the case with respect to those who do not disregard their ill health out of despair or negligence, or hide their dangerous wounds, or reject the medication of repentance with an impudent mind, but once having gotten sick through ignorance or error or necessity, have recourse with humble yet cautious mind to the heavenly physician. End of quote. No ill is incurable for the heavenly physician. To be delivered from it, man must only call to him and give himself over to the Lord in total trust. St. Cyril of Jerusalem recommends the following. Your wounds do not surpass the physician's skill. Have faith. Tell the physician what ails you. St. Basil 
likewise says, quote, The great physician of souls is ready to hear, heal your ill. If you yourself make an effort, he will not hesitate. End of quote. St. Macarius himself also calls to mind this minimum requirement of healing, that of calling upon the physician. Had not that blind man cried out, had not that sick woman with the flow of blood come to the Lord, they would not have found a cure. End of quote. The same saint also stresses that every man, even the one most weakened by illness, can at least fulfill this prerequisite. Quote, if one is stricken with an illness or fever, behold, the body lies stretched out on the bed, unable to do any earthly works. But at the same time, the tongue speaks of these works, and the spirit remains without rest. He starts to look for the physician and sends out his friends to seek him. In the same way, the soul has fallen into the illness of the passions ever since the transgression of the commandment. No vigor whatsoever remains to it. But if the soul approaches the Lord, believing that it will obtain assist assistance and renouncing its first foul life, even if the soul lies in the sickness of, of sin without being able to do the works of life in truth, it always preserves the power to make an effort toward life to supplicate the Lord, and to seek out the true physician. In summary, then, the person wanting to be healed has but a small step to take, which is not very painful. St. John Chrysostom remarks that the simple desire to be healed and the single act of our will suffice to obtain from Christ our soul's health, a fact that should encourage us to occupy ourselves with the soul's purification. Instead, we are led more often to give ill, to give all our care to the body. Yet bodily illnesses are less serious, spiritually seeking, and their therapy entails much greater care. Quote, For to cure the body when diseased is not an easy matter to everyone, but to cure a sick soul is easy to all, and the sickness of the body requires medicine as well as money for its healing. But the healing of a, the soul is a thing that is easy to procure and devoid of expense. And the nature of the flesh is with much labor delivered from the, those wounds that are troublesome. But with respect to the soul, there is nothing of this kind. It suffices only to exercise the will and the desire, and all things are accomplished. This being by far the most precious and necessary part of us, the Lord hath made the medicating of it easy, and void of expense or pain. When the body is sick, and money must be expended on its behalf, and physicians called in, and much anguish endured, we make this so much a matter of our care. Though what might result from that sickness could be no great injury to us, and yet treat the soul with neglect. And this, when we are neither called upon to pay down money, nor to give others any trouble, nor to sustain any sufferings. But without any of all these things, by only choosing and willing, have it in our power to accomplish the soul's entire amendment. End of quote. However, the desire to be healed must be made manifest not only when we have to call the physician, but also when we have to apply the remedies he suggests. St. Barsanufius mentions that if the sick man goes to find the physician, he must observe the physician's prescriptions. Noting further that whoever goes to the physician and does not follow the physician's orders exactly cannot be delivered from what ails him. St. John Chrysostom likewise insists on the sick person's need to cooperate with the physician and to take steps which support the effects of his remedies, and in the case of spiritual illnesses, to be with Christ and to want with all his being what Christ wants in light of man's healing. Quote, As in the case of physicians, there are three factors, or rather four, or even five. The physician, medical science, the patient, the illness, the power of the medicines, and a kind of battle or warfare develops. If on the one hand you see, along with the physician, medical science, and the medicines, that the patient cooperates, they overcome the illness. If, on the other hand, the patient withdraws from a position on the battle line, he reduces himself to ill health. 
or if he sides with the illness against the physician, the medicines, and medical science, he regresses. In exactly the same way it happens with us too, or rather, not in the same way, but much more unexpectedly. With God as the physician, the wound must be completely cured. End of quote from St. John Chrysostom's Commentary on Psalm. St. Barsanufius asks, If our great and heavenly physician has given us the remedies, where are we to find the cause of our ruin, if not in the infirmity of our will? Man makes his will to be healed and personally contributes to the divine therapy in an, essential, in an especially clear way through five basic spiritual attitudes that condition his life in Christ and allow him to perceive, take to himself, and bring to fruition the saving and therapeutic grace conferred by the Spirit in the Church's sacraments. These five attitudes are faith, repentance, prayer, hope, and the keeping of the commandments. 2. The Remedy of Faith Faith appears as the beginning of the new life that man is called to lead in God. It is the most powerful motive at man's disposal for achieving this. We have seen that faith is one of the attitudes the baptized person must exhibit in order for him to be able to pres preserve the grace he has received, and in order for this grace to manifest itself in him effectively. For the unbaptized person, or the person who has lapsed into illness after being baptized, faith is is the primary condition for healing. The sick man must not simply turn to Christ. He must also have faith in him. Through faith, he recognizes Christ as the only physician truly capable of healing his ills. He calls to him and is sure of receiving healing and salvation from him. This attitude presupposes at the outset an effort on the part of fallen man to go beyond the state of negligence or even indifference with regard to his fallen state and his spiritual illnesses as well as to quell the resistance put forth by the passions against God's saving and therapeutic grace. St. Augustine reveals to us that it was such resistance to God the physician that prevented him from being delivered from the ills afflicting him before his conversion. Quote, so it was with the health of my soul, which could not possibly be cured by believing, but refused to be cured. So I resisted thy hands. End of quote. By orienting his desire and his will toward Christ in faith, man first restores his natural object, and second, his normal end goal, the healing of his faculties, which sin had made ill by perverting their use, is wrought by the very action of faith. However, even though faith involves the continuous desire and above all, the will, to such an extent that it can be defined as quote, a voluntary ascent of the soul, it is correlatively knowledge. As St. Paul says, it is, quote, the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen, Hebrews 11.1. 1. It is a certain anticipated and indirect knowledge of spiritual realities. According to their proper mode, before the advent of the direct experience or knowledge that will be the fruit of the former, when the believer's faith has reached its highest point of development. Faith is the knowledge man acquires through the voluntary cleaving of the intellect or the noose and all his faculties to the truth revealed to men by the Holy Spirit through Christ's words and through the witness of the apostles, prophets, and saints. To the degree to which faith orients and attaches man to God, it frees man and keeps him safe from the pathological attachment to self and the passion of self-love. Nonetheless, faith's Therapeutic function appears most of all in the knowledge it simultaneously constitutes for and bestows on man. Just as ignorance is the first cause of man's fall and illnesses, so too the knowledge he acquires through faith is the beginning of his healing. Faith cures man of what St. John of Carpathos calls the illness of unbelief. Having fallen ill on account of having not known God, man regains his health by knowing God again through faith. One father teaches that, quote, the knowledge of God suffices for the soul's health. And St. Justin Martyr writes similarly, 
As the body's good is health, so the soul's good is the knowledge of God. For his part, St. Pacomius asks, If man, having been unaware of God and in error, is guided by faith in the Lord and sees the way of recognizing the one true God, is this not healing and salvation? When faith lifts from man's spirit one of the major veils that prevented him from seeing, it frees him to a certain extent from ignorance, and at any rate from all erroneous knowledge concerning God, if this faith itself is authentic. Theodore et of Cyprus, Cyrus, likewise notes that through faith all the false understandings that were in the soul, constituting in it a real source of infection, are eliminated so as to make room for divine ones. Through faith, then, are all man's intellectual faculties purified, cleansed, and restored to the wisdom bearing witness to their normal functioning. Thus, Theodoret of Cyprus, Cyrus notes that the Lord, through his teaching, quote, made the people who of old seemed mad and imbalanced, full of wisdom. End of quote. From Therapy of Hellenic Illnesses. To continue, man knowing through faith him who is the truth, John fourteen six, regains his true freedom, John eight thirty two, knowing God once again he regains true knowledge of himself, he knows again whose son he is, and what nature he is, he recognizes himself as God's image, destined to acquire his likeness, and recognizes the spiritual dimension, from which his being had been cut off through sin. And in this dimension, the fullness of his humanity. Through faith, man perceives the true meaning of his existence. He is thus freed from delusions and erring ways, engendered by his unawareness of life, as well as from the feeling of absurdity, anguish, and even despair, which he may have as a result. He, quote, leaves the waves of an unstable and changing life to enter the life immutable. Gregory of Nyssa thus finding peace and stability, the original prerequisite for his health. Subject to doubt, man could only remain subject to illness. He who is hesitant in his faith is conquered for this reason by sickness, writes St. Barsanufius. Faith puts an end to the pathological doubt, uncertainty, hesitation, indecisiveness, and irresoluteness that make man like a wave of the sea, that is driven and tossed by the wind, unstable in all his ways. James chapter 1, 6 and 8. When faith is strong, deep, whole, total, and fulfilled, it heals man's soul. Of dipsachia, this illness affecting those who, having an imperfect faith, remain divided in their intentions and actions. They keep their souls split between God and the world for lack of giving themselves over entirely, immediately, and with complete trust to Christ. Footnote, dipsychia, excuse the pronunciation, is not an illness of fallen man in general. Rather, it is an illness of the man who believes, but whose faith, as we have said, is weak and imperfect. In other words, it is the manifestation of what St. Isaac the Syrian calls a sick faith. See the ascetical homily 12, verse 26. For this reason, we neither studied it nor brought it to mind in the previous chapter dedicated to the pathology of fallen man. We prefer to speak of it in this chapter dedicated to faith, which it specifically concerns. It is rather difficult to study this illness in depth, for the Holy Fathers mention it quite rarely and without ever defining it precisely. The term Dipsychia, D-I-P-S-Y-C-H-I-A, is found in the epistle of St. James in two places, chapter 1, verse 8, chapter 4, verse 8, as well as in the Psalm 11, 1. The term is found especially in the writings of the Apostolic Fathers, in the Didache, the epistle of Barnabas, the epistle of Clement of Rome, his letters to the Corinthians, and especially in the Shepherd of Hermas in his visions, precepts, and similes. Additionally, there are sometimes found in the patristic writings of later centuries the same reference to this sick faith. 
found in John Chrysostom, Barsanufius, Cyril of Scythopolis, John Climacus, Simeon the New Theologian, and the idea is also found in John Cassianos and his Institutes. Based on the short notations contained in those different passages, one can say that sick faith, dipsychia, seems to the fathers to be fundamentally wicked and insane, according to Hermas and the shepherd. It makes man insane, causes him to act unwittingly in a wicked manner, Clement of Rome, causes him to fail in his actions, Hermas the shepherd and precepts, leads him to abandon the way of truth, apostasy. It withers and weakens his spirit. It holds man in sloth, acedia, and negligence. I mean the New Theologian's ethical treaties. It prevents him from communing with God, keeps him in a state between life and death, and does not allow him to be fully alive, Hermas the shepherd. It is usually linked to vain glory. John Climacus the latter, step 26. It is a sister of sadness. It prevents man from fighting as befits him with God in mind. It condemns man to misfortune, Clement of Rome, first letter to Corinthians. In light of these different characteristics, it seems clear that dipsychia and schizophrenia are only close etymologically. That is, dipsychia meaning literally double soul and schizophrenia divided soul or divided heart. For even though at first glance a reconciliation between the two terms is tempting, the rupture at the core of both terms is situated on radically different levels, even though in both cases it is possible to speak of a divided, quote, personality. To return to the text. They keep their souls split between God and the world for lack of giving themselves over entirely, immediately, and with complete trust to Christ. Since faith teaches man knowledge not only about himself, but also about everything else, it becomes for him a sure guide. Faith supports man in all things and allows him to direct his steps rightly in all circumstances, to avoid every distraction, and, quote, not to be swept away to the four winds according to the lot of poorly strengthened men. John Chrysostom. The fathers strongly stress that it is a solid support and a sure harbor. Faith is a breastplate that protects man and strengthens him. Thanks to faith, man can overcome the most difficult obstacles, even to the point of moving mountains. For him who possesses faith, nothing is impossible. St. John Chrysostom observes, quote, Faith does not leave our soul overwhelmed by the army of present ills, but comforts its misery with the future hope. He continues, With it, the greatest misfortune is unable to drive us to despair. Just like St. John Chrysostom, St. Barsanufius, St. Isaac the Syrian, and St. Peter Damascene emphasize this power of faith to instill hope. Whereas sin had divided and dispersed man's faculties, faith by reorienting them toward Christ as toward a single pole and by uniting all man's being to Christ's person, and not just his desire, will, and the intellect, reunifies the soul and restructures it. Thanks to the energetic striving of his volition toward the one, everything that was disordered in man is ordered. Dionysios the Areopagites. All the faculties find again their normal end goal in health in God, to whom man unites himself by faith. They function in harmony and peace and flourish in conformity with their nature. Whereas man was dead through sin, he lives again through faith, with a life that will have no end. This true life restored by Christ to mankind and given by the Spirit. Death's anguish thus ceases to grip and paralyze him. He ceases to be one of the living dead, so as to become one who lives eternally. Through faith, the old man makes way for the new man, born of God. 1 John 5, 1. For man, faith is the requirement and door of salvation, since through it he clings with all his being to Christ's saving work, unites himself to Christ's grace, and becomes a co-worker in it. So too, through and in proportion to faith, 
the sick man receives from Christ the pardon of his sins, the healing of all his illnesses, and true health. Christ grants healing of bodily and spiritual illnesses to him who has faith in him. St. Barsanufius writes, quote, If one has faith in him who has come to heal every sickness and infirmity in the multitude, he is capable of healing not only bodily illnesses, but also those of the inner man. We now understand that faith seems to be one of the links between health and salvation, as Clement of Alexandria stresses, and that many other fathers unequivocally affirm its therapeutic function and value. Tertullian considers it as the remedy par excellence. St. Augustine, confessing the sins of his former life, acknowledges, by believing, I might have been cured noting that God has prepared the medicines of faith and applied them to the diseases of the world and given them such potency. Likewise, Theodoret of Cyrus points out that, quote, God comes to the aid of those who desire to be treated by giving them faith. Origen remarks that already the blessed prophets touched the word by faith so that an emanation came to them from him so as to heal them. And St. Barsanufius observes that our perfect faith is reflected in healing. However, one must know that there are many degrees of faith and that there is a great distance between its first manifestation and its fulfillment, between the effort to believe in what one does not see and the sense of total certainty, and further, between the initial devotion to the Word of God in which one finds an exterior and quite partial kind of knowledge, and the vision of God which the fathers also likened to faith possessed in its perfection. Between these two extremities lie all the degrees of existential devotion to God, realized by the keeping of the commandments, which itself stems from faith and indeed forms the basis of the only true faith. One who believes but remains spiritually ill is one who has but a naked faith, that is a faith not clothed in the works of the commandments, Indeed, as St. Macario stresses, such a faith does not suffice to re receive healing from God. Quote, Unless a man comes to the Lord and petitions him with assurance of faith, he finds no cure. Why was it that they, that is, the blind man and the woman with the issue of blood, were at once cured on believing, while we have not yet seen truly in a clear manner and have not been cured of the hidden affect affectations? It is because of our unbelief because of our divided mind, because we do not love him with all our heart and we do not really believe him, let us then believe him and come to him in truth that he may speedily work in us the true cure. I mean. Three, the remedy of repentance. Baptism purifies man of all his sins. After the sacraments bestowal, nothing remains in him that is not forgiven, purified, and healed. Yet while baptism removes sin, it does not remove the possibility of sinning. It puts an end to the tyranny of the devil and the demons, but does not prevent them from tempting man, nor man from abandoning himself to their will. What baptism gives to the person receiving it is the ability not to be subject to these powers any longer against his will, to resist their suggestions and not be affected by them. But our autonomy and free will are not suppressed. Quote, after baptism, neither God nor Satan violates the will. Free to do good in conformity with the grace we have received, we are also free to return to evil. For as St. Nicholas Cavasilis explains, quote, the benefit of baptism does not throttle or restrain the will, since it, the will, is a faculty. Nothing prevents those who enjoy its use from living in wickedness if they so wish. Just as the possession of a sound eye would not prevent those who desire it from living in darkness. Just as God had created Adam free and had allowed him to undergo the serpent's temptation, so too does he leave the newly baptized person free and permits the demons to tempt him. God allows this in order that man might not be saved despite himself, but rather that he might manifest the whole reality of his will to be healed in Christ, as well as the degree of his attachment to God in his resistance to the temptations. He further allows this in order that man might become 
the free co-worker in his own healing, salvation, and deification, and in order that he might personally and voluntarily make his own the gifts he has received. If man were to strive with all his being to preserve and assimilate to himself the grace conferred in the sacraments without ever departing from this path, he would remain in the state of health and purity that baptism had restored to his nature. The fathers point out that it is not a a priori impossible for man to lead a life in which he would commit no sin and would keep all Christ's commandments, but that, in fact, very few baptized persons have really been aware of all the grace they have received. In regard to baptism, St. Simeon the New Theologian writes in his hymns, quote, All of us are far from having recognized the grace, the illumination, indeed, the simple fact of such a birth. No, scarcely one in a thousand, or even one in ten thousand, have recognized this in mystical contemplation, whereas the others, all of them, are stillborn infants who are unaware of him who brought them into the world. And St. Nicholas Cabasilas likewise notes with regard to chrismation, quote, but the gifts chrismation always procures for Christians, and which are always timely, are the gifts of godliness, prayer, love, and sobriety, and the other gifts which are opportune for those who receive them. Yet they elude many Christians. The greatness and power of this mystery is hidden from them. As it is written in the Acts, they did not even know that there is a Holy Spirit. Acts 19.2 Since they have no perception of its gifts when it was received, and they receive them. End of quote. Thus, if the effects of the sacraments do not make themselves felt in those who have received them, if these persons have not found in themselves the health bestowed by these sacraments, but remain affected by diverse illnesses, this is because they do not have the necessary spiritual aptitude to assimilate and absorb from these sacraments the grace transmitted by them. Such persons have not sufficiently prepared themselves to receive this grace, or have not displayed the zeal needed to preserve it. They have not kept themselves in the state of purity and health into which they had been placed. They have voluntarily given in to the devil's suggestions and have returned to sin of their own will. And they have done all this because in every regard they have shown themselves negligent in keeping the commandments, which keeping alone allows the grace mystically received at baptism to manifest its effects. Herein lies a, a constant theme in St. Mark the Ascetic's teaching. In particular, he writes, from St. Mark the Ascetic on baptism, quote, The purification wrought and mystically realized by holy baptism is shown to be efficacious by the keeping of the commandments. We are dominated by sin because we neglect the commandments of him who purified us. Those who are subject to the passions, quote, have been set free by Christ and have given themselves over in slavery to the vices by neglecting to fulfill all the commandments and thus made themselves dependent once again. In order that man might not be forever unaware of the grace of baptism and might not lose for good the purity, health, and all the gifts received in the sacrament, but on the contrary, might be able to regain them, God has given sinful man the remedy of repentance. Matanya, change of direction. As St. John Chrysostom explains, there is a return if we want, and it is possible to go back to the beauty and brilliance that once was. If only we bring it to our aid, after the soul is sullied and has fallen into ugliness and shame as a result of its numerous sins, it can return very quickly to its primal beauty if we show serious and sincere repentance. From his baptismal catechesis. St. Simeon the New Theologian writes similarly, quote, He who has defiled himself after baptism by unseemly acts and iniquities needs to repent with the aim of regaining for himself the same div divine dignity that he had lost through his life of sin. The same saint says further that God has given men this remedy of repentance, quote, in order that those who by sloth or negligence fall from eternal life may come to it again through repentance with a more brilliant and manifest glory. Saints Callistos and Ignatius Xanthopouli teach the same thing, quote, from the Philokalia, in God's bosom, that is to say, in the holy font of baptism, we receive the totally perfect gift, divine grace. 
and if consequently through the misuse of temporal things, through the worry over things of life, and through the mists of the passions, we cover up this grace as we ought not. Yet is it still possible for us, through repentance and the fulfillment of the commandment of the divine work, immediately to recover and acquire anew this gladsome supernatural light and behold, behold its clearest revelation. St. John Climacus thus writes that repentance is the renewal of baptism. And many fathers go so far as to regar regard this spiritual attitude as a second baptism. St. Isaac the Syrian notes, quote, Repentance has been given to man after baptism. Indeed, repentance is a second birth coming from God. What we received as a pledge through baptism, we receive as a gift through repentance. Sedical Homily 72. This does not mean that repentance can be substituted for baptism, or that it bears some gift that baptism would not confer, somehow completing the sacrament. As we've stressed, baptism gives man everything he needs in order to be healed and saved, and repentance by itself, lacking baptism, can neither heal nor save man. See St. Simeon the New Theologian's Catechesis 23. To continue. The role of repentance after baptism is to permit the Christian to turn away from the sin and the passions into which he has fallen again, to be purified and healed of them anew, to restore in this way the state of grace given in the sacrament, to revive this grace in himself, and to have it bear fruit in him once again. In repentance, man finds neither another baptism nor even the baptism he received, for he never lost it, rather he discovers its fruits which he had abandoned as a result of his sloth, negligence, and return to sin and the passions. Properly understood, repentance does not merely concern the baptized person who has sinned. It is absolutely necessary for every man, whatever his state may be, who wishes to turn away from sin and toward God. It concerns, then, whoever has not yet been baptized and who God calls to salvation, as well as whoever has not yet attained perfection, though he may already be far along the path of salvation. Thus, practically everyone is always in need of repentance. It is an essential prerequisite of fallen man's healing, being one of the primary foundations of his salvation and return to health. The preaching of the Holy Gospel, the proclamation of the good tidings of salvation, began therefore with the preaching of repentance, that inauguration and characteristic mark of St. John the Baptist's teachings. Likewise, according to the evangelists, Saints Matthew and Mark, Christ's teaching in public began with this, quote, From that time Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Matthew 4.17 and Mark 1.15 According to the Gospel of St. Luke, Christ completes and closes his earthly mission prior to his ascension by calling repentance to mind. Luke 24, verse 47. In the Holy Scriptures, we see the forerunner, Christ, and the apostles constantly preaching repentance and presenting it as a practical essential to salvation. St. Simeon, the New Theologian, sees in repentance the first commandment. According to the Fathers, repenting is the spiritual activity that must take precedence over all others, the activity to which man must devote himself above all even almost exclusively, the activity by which everything to be done on his part in order to be healed and saved can be summed up. St. Thalassius writes, quote, Christ is the Savior of the entire world, and he has given repentance to men for their salvation. And St. Mark the ascetic begins his treatise on repentance thus, quote, our Lord Jesus Christ, preparing the salvation of all in conformity with what he knew to be worthy of God, established the law of liberty in different prescriptions, and set a single fitting goal for all when he said, Repent, in order that we might be able to understand by this that the whole diversity of commandments can be summed up into a single one, that of repentance. To continue. Repentance is an inner attitude by which man acknowledges his faults, or more generally, his sinful state, detaches himself from them, asks forgiveness from God, 
and by invoking his help demonstrates his will to sin no longer in the future, not to remain separated from God, and to return to him by changing his attitude. The fathers see in repentance a process of conversion whose aim is less sin itself than the return to God. What counts is not the past, but the future. Not sickness, but health. Not separation from God, but reunion with Him. The positive side of repentance is well noted, for example, in the definition given by St. John Cashin from Conference 20. Quote, Here is the full and perfect definition of repentance, that we should never again commit the sins for which we do penance and on account of which our conscience is pricked. End of quote. And likewise, in response, Abba Pimon gives to a monk who asks him what, what the repentance of sin is, not to commit it in the future, from the sayings. The fundamental goal of repentance is that a change, a turnaround, takes place. As the very etymology of the word metania indicates, man demonstrates the true meaning of repentance by ceasing to sin and by renouncing the passion so as to live according to God in virtue. Thus, St. John Climacus defines it as, quote, reconciliation with the Lord by the practice of good deeds contrary to the sins. First of all, repentance for man begins with the acknowledgement of one's sins. Herein lies an indispensable prerequisite to overcoming sins, being healed of them and being saved. From this perspective, St. Ephraim the Syrian writes, quote, The beginning of salvation is to know oneself. Such knowledge is obtained in the first place by methodically examining one's conscience. Abba Nestorius teaches that man, quote, ought to ask himself every night and every morning, what have we done that is as God wills, and what have we left undone of that which he does not will? He must do this throughout his whole life. Thus must repentance be, concludes another elder, after giving the same teaching and providing as reference the practice of Abba Arsenios. St. Dorotheus of Gaza, while recalling these recommendations of the Desert Fathers, himself advocates, quote, that we also examine ourselves every six hours so as to know how we have spent them and in what way we have sinned. St. John Climacus suggests taking in account every hour so as not to forget anything, the latter nine. In fact, as we shall see, this examination of conscience must be permanent, accompanying every action and thought, and becoming a continual preoccupation for the person who keeps healing and salvation in mind. St. John Climacus writes, Repentance is self-condemning reflection and carefree self-care. This awareness of sin constitutes a fundamental moment of repentance, an indispensable prerequisite for spiritual progress, and an essential step in the healing process. Such awareness allows man not to be blindly subject to his sin any longer, but to distance himself from it and break off his ties to it, to consider reality no longer from the point of view of sin and his fallen ego, and to come out of his pathological egocentrism. The simple awareness of sin as such is already cathartic and liberating. St. Barsanufius writes to a brother, Blessed are you if you are perfectly aware of your faults, for whoever is aware of them comes to loathe them and rids himself of them. Sin is not the object of some abstract acknowledgement in repentance. Indeed, repentance assumes that man painfully feels his sinful state. It is in this sense that St. John Climacus says that repentance is, quote, a striking of the soul into vigorous awareness. The latter step five. In such an attitude as the psalmist states, the spirit must be broken and the heart broken and contrite. Here is the contrition of heart, without which no one can be healed of the passions, as St. Barfanusius teaches. Yet this pain has no connection to the pain produced by remorse, a pathological state in which the sinner remains trapped in his sin, keeping his eyes fixed on it and remaining passive in the face of it. In remorse, man continues the sin under a different guise and becomes sick in another way. He remains focused on the fault committed and on his state, not succeeding in detaching himself from them. In repentance, on the contrary, the sinner focuses on God. 
He does not feel pain on account of the sin itself. He is not sad because of his wounded ego. If he is suffering, it is because he has separated himself from God by his sin and because his sinful state keeps him distance from him. Repentance, therefore, excludes every pathological feeling of guilt that might distress or paralyze a person. At the same time as acknowledging his sin, man asks God for forgiveness and shows his willingness to reunite himself to God when he repents. Far from being content with noticing some failure and remaining focused on it, repentance is revealed to be an attitude of overcoming sin. Through it, man turns away from his past, belonging to the old man, so as to strive toward the future, belonging to the new man he is called to become. Through repentance, man constantly transcends his imperfections and goes beyond himself with God as the goal. St. Paul confides, quote, forgetting what lies behind, a strain toward what lies ahead, Philippians 3.13. Man is able to obtain healing and salvation not by dwelling on what he has done or been according to the condition of fallen man, but by pushing forward to what he must be, according to God. St. Barsanufius observes that since man always sees himself going backward when he repents, he is actually making progress. From a practical point of view, this progress is observed in the lessening of the number of sins that man commits, as well as in the weakening and reduction of his passions. Referring to the sayings of an elder, Clement of Alexandria writes, quote, Repentance bears witness to great wisdom. Indeed, when one repents of what one has done, one no longer does or says it. And by mortifying the soul with regard to these sins, one does good. The progress is often slow, but takes place gradually and steadily if one patiently perseveres in a repentant frame of mind. St. Dorotheus of Gaza observes that if you examine yourself every day, as he recommends, quote, you begin to lessen the frequency of sin by putting forth an effort to repent of your faults and to rid yourself of them. For example, committing a sin eight times instead of nine. In this way, gradually making progress with God's help, you will prevent the passions from growing strong in you. By examining oneself every moment, by systematically repenting of one's sins and opposing each passionate thought with an attitude of repentance, man can succeed in progressively conquering by God's grace all the passions dwelling within him, and thus in being healed of all his spiritual illnesses. Let us stress that repentance must not focus solely on specific sinful acts or thoughts. Man must repent of his entire sinful state in general. The fathers say that the Christian must maintain a permanent and true remembrance of his sins. It is not a matter here of recalling all the sins one may have committed in every detail, such recollection would risk plunging the mind into the same sins again, but of being aware that one has sinned and that it is possible for one to sin again in like or different manner. In other words, it is a matter of acknowledging one's state of weakness, insufficiency, and estrangement from God. The awareness of past sins has the aim that one should be aware and avoid them, both now and in the future, by breaking the links to the passions from which sins issue forth, and invoking God's grace to do so. In this perspective, St. Isaac the Syrian defines repentance as, quote, a continual supplication, a supplication of every hour, asking of God the absolution of the past, but also as, quote, the affliction in which we keep things from happening. St. John Chrysostom likewise says, we must always keep present the memory of our sins, even after being purified of them. The memory of the past is the safeguard of the future. It is thus fitting to repent even if one has no specific sin in mind. Moreover, the fathers point out that man would delude himself in thinking he were without sin. The book of Proverbs emphasizes that even a righteous man falls seven times a day. Proverbs twenty four sixteen. To think that one is without sin only shows that one is ignorant of one's state. This is why the fathers recommend repenting of one's conscience as well as unconscious sins. As St. John the Theologian himself instructs, quote, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. 1 John 1, 8. 
Besides, sin consists not only in committing evil, but also in not doing good. James 4.17 Properly speaking, every act or thought by which man voluntarily turns away from God's will is a sin, but neglecting to do God's will is also a sin. As St. Mark the Ascetic points out, quote, No one can be found innocent in the span of his days who has ever neglected the Lord's precepts in anything. To this we must add that everything within man that keeps him estranged from God constitutes a sinful state. Man can thus consider himself to be in a state of sin insofar as he is not totally united to God and has not yet actualized a full conformity to Christ. Repentance is thus necessary for all, and the fathers recommend repentance at every instant. St. Isaac the Syrian writes, quote, It is important to know that we have need of repentance during the length of the 24 hours of the day and night. In every act and thought, man must note his insufficiency, and consider himself as standing below what he ought to be, according to God, and what he would be had he actualized the state of perfection to which he is called by nature in total union with God. For this reason, St. Barsanufius advises, in all things, condemn yourselves always as a sinner and transgressor. And again, we must always be quite convinced that we sin in everything, in thought, word, and deed. From continual repentance, are born grief and compunction, which in turn gives birth to tears. These three states, which we will study later, constitute repentance's fulfillment. The last of these is a gift of the Spirit few men manage to obtain, but to which the patristic teachings on repentance accord fundamental importance. Repentance is considered by the fathers to be a first-rate cure, they often evoke this spiritual attitude in medical terms. St. Simeon, the New Theologian, speaks of the salutary remedy of repentance given men by God. This manner of looking at repentance from a medical viewpoint is constant in the writings of St. John Chrysostom, who says, for example, from his homilies on repentance, on compunction, on the statutes, and on demons, quote, repentance is the healing of sin, and Sin is the wound, repentance the cure, and what the wound and the cure are to the body, sin and repentance are to the soul. And let us use the salvific cure, repentance, or rather let us receive from the very hand of God this repentance, which must needs heal us. And brethren, let us receive repentance, the cure that will save us, as the cure that will destroy our sins. And you are all sinners, do not despair. I never tire of offering you this cure so as to ease your ills. And in support of my discourse, I produce not one man, nor two, nor three, but thousands of men covered with wounds and ulcers, defiled by thousands of crimes, and have been healed by repentance in such a way that neither scar nor trace of their ancient ills has remained. And if when one is completely covered with sin's wounds, he repents, God will cause them to disappear in such a way that neither scar nor trace nor indication of these will be visible. And if God sees sinners willing to repent, he treats and heals them. When they are charged with crimes and completely covered with ulcers, without any scar, trace, or mark of their sins remaining, and let us be convinced of all the efficacy of the cure of repentance. End of quotes from St. John, the Golden Mouth. To continue, repentance seems to be a cure because through it man receives from God not only the purification of his sins, but also the healing of his spiritual illnesses, namely the passions, as many of the previously cited patristic teachings indicate. When practiced over a long period of time and profoundly experienced, repentance allows man to attain little by little to impassibility or dispassion, a state in which he recovers full freedom and health and which is impossible to attain without this repentance. Through the forgiveness of his sins and the healing of his passions, which repentance procures for man, he can regain inner peace. St. Barsanufius writes, quote, Let us return to God through repentance, and he will pacify everything. And St. Dorotheus of Gaza notes, quote, One enters at last into rest again through contrition of heart, end quote. Man lives again according to the virtues to the extent that he is healed of his passions. 
He can thus lead a new, a healthy, and normal existence in conformity with his authentic nature. In this sense, St. John Damascene says that repentance, quote, is the return from what is contrary to nature to what is proper to it, from his exact exposition of the Orthodox faith. Moreover, repentance appears to be the only path that allows sinful man to recover the virtues. Rightly do many fathers consider it as the first commandment, since it is the prerequisite for keeping all the others. Only by turning away from his passions, by breaking the ties to evil, by beseeching God for the forgiveness of his sins, and by painfully sensing his own wretchedness on account of his separation from God, can man feel the necessity of turning toward divine grace and fully opening himself to the Holy Spirit, the source of all virtue. Only by casting off the skin garments of sin and the passions can man clothe himself in the grace constituting the virtues of the new and healthy man in Christ. We thus understand that the fathers see in repentance, compunction, and tears the foundation for achieving all the virtues. Having regained the virtues, thanks to repentance, man regains true life. St. John Chrysostom says, quote, Tears give life to him who is dead in soul. He says further, quote, Repentance revives the man who is spiritually dead. On the contrary, the absence of repentance condemns man to remain in death. Christ himself teaches, quote, Unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Luke 13, verses 3 and 5. Although the soul has become deformed in every way by leaving the right path of virtue, repentance sets it aright in all its faculties. Repentance especially forms a basic therapy for man's faculties of knowledge that have been sickened by the passions. By repenting, man ceases to be blind in his knowledge of reality, and most of all, himself. Acknowledging himself to be a sinner and being aware of his wretchedness, Man is aware of his separation from God and acknowledges his deviation in relation to him. As St. Hermas notes, men made mad and senseless by sin rec recognize their own madness in repentance. From the Shepherd, simile 9. In the practice of continual repentance, man comes to know himself better and better. He comes to perceive more and more keenly the evil within him even as far as discerning the smallest faults and lapses. He thus notices illnesses in his soul that remain invisible and unconscious to the man who continues to live in sin. By repenting even of his unconscious and involuntary faults, he hunts down sin and strikes at illness in their most withdrawn, most subtle, and secret strongholds, and simultaneously flushes them out and expels them from his soul by invoking the power of divine grace. This knowledge that man acquires of his pathological state through repentance is an indispensable requirement for his salvation, since he must first note how his soul is sick in order to be able to ask and receive the proper treatment from the divine physician. St. Simeon the New Theologian asks, quote, how would the man who does not even allow himself to be convinced that he is sick and wounded consent to be cared for? St. John Chrysostom also gives this advice. Quote, Let us frankly acknowledge what we are and what our soul's wounds are. This is the means of remedying it. Whoever does not know his illness does not worry about his infirmity. End of quote. St. John Chrysostom on the demons. To continue, we have already said that God, respecting of man's freedom, does not heal him without consent, but waits for man to show the desire to be cared for by him and to call upon the aid of his therapeutic grace. If man does so, God heals him without fail. It is precisely in repentance that man, acknowledging his illness, calls on the heavenly physician's help so as to obtain the healing of his illness, and he receives it. St. John Cashin writes, quote from conferences, in truth, curative remedies cannot be lacking to those who look for healing from the most true physician of souls. This is especially the case with respect to those who do not disregard their ill health out of despair or negligence, or hide their dangerous wounds, or reject the medication of repentance with an impudent mind, but, 
once having gotten sick through ignorance or error or necessity, they have recourse with humble yet cautious mind to the heavenly physician. End of quote. Repentance forms a way to access not only knowledge of self, but also the true knowledge of every reality, including the highest spiritual realities. He who repents is indeed purified by God of his sins and passions, and the veil that obscured his faculties of knowledge is gradually lifted. The spirit then enlightens his noose to the extent that he has been purified. St. Simeon, the new theologian, notes, quote, through repentance man acquires anew the splendor proper to him. Repentance is the door that causes darkness to exit so that light may enter. End of quote from Catechesis. He states in greater detail, quote, Behold, the proper fruit and work of repentance is precisely what simultaneously drives away ignorance and procures knowledge. By knowledge, I mean, first of all, knowledge of ourselves and of what concerns us, and then of what surpasses us, and of the divine mysteries that are invisible and unknowable to those who do not repent. The divine truths are revealed only to those who ardently repent and who have been suitably purified by sincere repentance, and this in proportion and to the extent of their repentance and purification. To them are revealed the depths of the Spirit, but to all the rest, these truths remain unknowable and hidden. End of quote. It follows from this passage that the knowledge of self and of God which man attains through repentance is not a theoretical, abstract knowledge, but an existential understanding, a knowledge inspired by the spirit of the noose united to the heart. Moreover, repentance appears to the fathers as a direct way to bring about in man the reunification of these two faculties, united and acting in concert in man's original nature but disassociated in the state of sin and constituting a fundamental pathological break and division in his being. This reunification is one of the essential requirements for attaining to authentic and pure prayer, an activity in which the intellect or noose functions according to its natural end goal and regains its normal use. If compunction supports prayer, renders it fruitful, and must always be connected with it, this is so because man, through his attitude, is not only purified, but also becomes humble, deeply feeling his need of God and the painful experience of his wretchedness and estrangement from the Lord, thus fully opening himself to God's grace. It is also because this attitude of compunction allows prayer to be not only an intellectual activity, but also something that engages all man's being, the center of which is the heart. By turning man toward God and supporting his prayer, repentance allows him to benefit from God's help in all circumstances. Man can thus face the difficulties, the different difficulties, both internal and external, as well as the multifarious dangers that he encounters. Moreover, compunction has the effect of strengthening the soul. Thus the psalmist writes, quote, My tears have been my food day and night. Psalm 41, 4. Compunction also increases man's resistance to the thoughts by which the demons suggest sin to him. The fathers teach that it constitutes a powerful weapon in confronting temptations. In addition, repentance has the power to reduce the troublesome demons to powerlessness and to banish them from the soul. St. Barsanufius writes, quote, Whoever possesses true tears accompanied by compunction is not conquered in any fight, they are a shield, repelling all the flaming darts of the evil one. Ephesians 6.16 Whoever possesses them will most assuredly not be struck in combat. For his part, St. John Chrysostom writes, quote, The devil always flees before repentance's keen edge. And St. John Climacus imagines the demons as saying, quote, There is only one thing in which we have no power to meddle. If you keep up a sincere condemnation of yourself before the Lord, you can count us as weak as a cobweb. Step 23. We see then that repentance has a preventative as well as therapeutic function. Abba Pimon says, quote, If a man accuses himself, he is protected on all sides. St. Barsanufius writes, quote, The tears that are 
continuously shed in God's name keep safe the man who has acquired them. He also points out that when man has attained dispassion, repentance is what keeps him safe from the attacks of the passions. One sees then how repentance constitutes an essential task for man on all levels of the spiritual life to such an extent that St. John Climacus writes, quote, When our soul leaves this world, we shall not be blamed for not having worked miracles, or for not having been theologians, or not having been wrapped in theoria. No, but we shall certainly have to give an account to God of why we have not unceasingly mourned. Ladder 7, Step 7. To conclude, St. Isaac the Syrian likewise places repentance among the highest and most necessary spiritual attitudes, speaking in an equally striking manner. From Ascetical Homily 34. He who knows his sins is greater than he who raises the dead by his prayer. He who groans for one hour over his soul is greater than he who serves the world through his contemplation. He to whom it has been given to see himself is greater than he to whom it has been given to behold the angels. End of quote. 4. The Remedy of Prayer A. Prayer's Role in Its Therapeutic Effects Through faith, man acknowledges Christ as his God and as the only physician capable of healing him. Through repentance, he turns toward him by being sorry for his sins so as to be forgiven them. He draws near to him by acknowledging his state of sickness so as to be healed of it. He makes plain before him the painful awareness of his inadequacies so as to draw near to him and never turn away. Prayer seems to be the complement of these two attitudes. Through it, man evokes God's help to obtain the care of his spirit his state requires, to be healed and purified, to open up to his grace, and to be united to him. Through prayer, man can put himself in God's presence, enter into relation with him, and be united to him. St. Gregory Palamas writes that it is Quote, the link that unites creatures to their creator from his three chapters on prayer and purity of the heart. Such a link is certainly established by the reception of the sacraments, and especially baptism, chrismation, and the Eucharist, which restore to man the primal splendor of God's image and the reestablishment of his likeness, conferring on him the fullness of grace. But, as we have seen, this reestablishment occurs potentially, or, as St. Mark the Ascetic says, mystically. It remains for the Christian personally to take to himself the grace received, to assimilate it to himself, to actualize it in himself, and to grow in and through it. Prayer is necessary and plays an essential role in this work. Indeed, man can establish through prayer a personal relationship with God who is present in him by his grace. He can give his free assent to the saving transformation that God works through prayer and can become a conscious and willing co-worker in the salvation and deification accomplished by the Father in Christ by the Holy Spirit. Henceforth, the goal man pursues through prayer is not to make God come to him, but rather for himself to go to God. Not because God is far away, but because man, whether because he has turned away from God through sin or has not taken to himself all the grace received, remains distant from him, outside him who is most interior to him, and who is even closer to man than man's own heart, as St. Nicholas Cabasilas writes in The Life in Christ. St. Gregory Palamas records, quote, We supplicate God not to draw God to us, for he is everywhere, but to raise ourselves to him by the invocation we address to him, and to return to him. End of quote on the divine names. Here from St. Dionysius Areopagite says the same thing with different words. Quote, if it is true that the Holy Trinity is present in every being, not every being dwells there. Yet by beseeching the Holy Trinity with very holy prayers, we also shall abide there. Prayer is thus seen as the beginning of acquiring all grace. God is permanently bestowing his grace but he does not impose it. Respectful as he is of man's freedom, he waits for man to ask it of him. 
prayer constitutes the means of this request, in which man's free will is affirmed in full awareness. As soon as man speaks to God, the Lord hears his prayer. Like the apostles, Christ himself never ceases to remind us, quote, ask and it will be given you. For everyone who asks, receives, Matthew 7, 7. And whatever you ask in prayer, you will receive if you have faith. Matthew 21, 22. And ask and it will be given to you. For everyone who asks, receives, Luke 11, 9, following. And whatever you ask in my name, I will do it, John 14, 13. And if you ask anything in my name, I will do it, again, John chapter 14. And we receive from him whatever we ask, 1 John 3, 22. Christ himself tells us that grace and consequently the gift is already here, present with us. Quote, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it. Mark eleven twenty four. If man has not taken to himself this grace that is present in him, it is because he has not opened himself up to it and has not through prayer turned to him who gave him prayer, who is present in and through prayer. St. James declares to us, quote, you do not have because you do not ask. James 4, 2. In order to be heard, prayer must always be done as is fitting. If you ask and do not receive, it is because you ask wrongly, St. James tells us. Prayer must be made with faith. Repentance constitutes an especially vital and indispensable attitude, so much so that the fathers see in it an essential component of prayer. St. John Cassian goes so far as to define it as, quote, an imploring by a person who has been struck by compunction. Evagoras writes in the same sense, quote, the specific quality of prayer is that it is a respectful gravity which is colored by compunction. It has something of a deep felt sorrow about it, the kind one feels when, amid silent groans, he really admits his sins. It's chapters on prayer. Without such an attitude of repentance, prayer cannot be effective. In order to be able to approach God, man must first measure the distance separating him from God. In order to be able to receive the healing of his ills, man must first acknowledge, be sorry for the sins which are the cause of these ills. In order to attain grace, he must first painfully feel his need of it. Besides faith and repentance, the requirements for effective prayer are nepsis, attention, watchfulness, and sobriety fervor, assiduousness, humility, and above all, purity of heart. The object of one's request must also be in conformity with the will of God. See 1 John 5.14. Who has our real good and our genuine interest in mind. Prayer is the source of acquiring all grace, and by this fact it is also the source of the healing of the sick man and his return to health. Through prayer, man addresses Christ the physician, so as to obtain from him the healing of his ills. In God alone can we find all the help and assistance he needs in his illnesses. St. Barsanufius writes, quote, We know well that those who are ill always have need of the physician and his remedies. This is why the prophet cried, Thou hast been our refuge from generation to generation. And if he is our refuge, let us recall that he said, Call upon me in the day of affliction, I will deliver you, and you shall glorify me. Psalm 49, 15. St. John Chrysostom notes that the time of prayer is when we can show our wounds to the physician and obtain their complete healing. He therefore speaks to those made sick by sin. Do not seek refuge with men. Do not cast your eyes on the help that perishes. But leaving this aside, run in thought to the physician of souls. The only one able to cure the wounds of your heart is he who has made each of us and knows all your works. It suffices to cry to him from the depths of the heart and to offer him our tears. Homily on repentance. To continue. As for St. John Climacus, he recommends him who prays to take as his model, quote, the way the sick implore the surgeons when they are about to be operated on or cauterized. 
In response to his prayer, man receives from Christ the treatment befitting his state and obtains the healing of his illnesses. Hence, it is not surprising that the fathers consider prayer to be a particularly powerful remedy. Prayer is a remedy, writes St. John Chrysostom, who goes on to say that prayer is a medicine of salvation. Our salvation is there, the medicine for our souls, and the cure for the illnesses that develop in it. Baptismal Catechesis. The power of prayer heals our illnesses. As for St. Isaac the Syrian, he notes that, quote, prayer is the strongest aid against illnesses, end of quote. And St. John Climacus personifies prayer as saying, Come unto me, and ye shall find healing for your wounds. With regard to the immense power of prayer, St. John Chrysostom unceasingly stresses, Great is the power of prayer. And nothing, I tell you, nothing is more powerful than pure and ardent prayer, for it alone can deliver us from the present ills. And let us constantly appeal to God. Let us ask all things of him, for nothing equals prayer. It makes possible what is impossible, easy what is difficult, flat what is covered with obstacles. Whereas without prayer, nothing is possible. Apart from me, you can do nothing. John 15.5 through prayer, all things are possible for man, for it allows him to call upon him who by the power at work within us is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think. Ephesians 3.20 Since sin and the passions constitute the root and forms of an illness, man must first of all pray to God for the forgiveness of these and for purification of the heart. Origen notes, that in every prayer one must accuse oneself of his sins before God with bitter sorrow and asking of him the healing of the inclination leading us to sin and the pardon of our past offenses. From then on, prayer's therapeutic power manifests itself first of all in the healing of sins. St. John Chrysostom says, quote, prayer is an antidote against sin, a cure for sins. Elsewhere he teaches, Every day we receive numerous injuries. Let us apply to all these wounds the fitting remedy, prayer. For God, if we pray him with watchful mind, a soul ablaze and an ardent heart, can grant us our pardon, the remission of our sins. Prayer, as St. John Climacus notes on his part, is, quote, a sovereign remedy for the greatest of sins. And St. Nicholas Cabasilis writes, we invoke the name of God of goodness with our mouth, with our desire, and with our thought in order to apply to everything by which we have sinned the sole salutary remedy. St. John the Apostle teaches, Your sins are forgiven for his sake. 1 John 2.12 On a deeper level, prayer heals man of the passions, which are his illnesses, completely cutting them out of his being and annihilating them even in their effects. But it must be noted that it is primarily unceasing prayer that possesses such power, which fact is clear inasmuch as the passions, in contrast to sins, which are one-time acts, constitute permanent states. St. Barsanufius writes, quote, The act of ceaselessly calling upon God is a remedy that obliterates all the passions. From his letters, even though he remarks that this remedies modus operandi is incomprehensible to us. Quote, Indeed, just as the physician applies the remedy or poultice on the patient's wound and the effect is produced without the patient knowing how, so too the name of God, when invoked, destroys all the passions, even if we do not know how. End of quote. Prayer is a detergent of the soul, cleansing even its most hidden and secret recesses, Prayer has the power to strike down and heal unconscious sins and passions because it seeks the intervention of him who sees in secret, who searches the hearts, who brings to light the things now hidden in darkness and discloses the purposes of the heart, and who has the power to destroy every sin and annihilate every trace of passion. In addition, the Christian, whom sin has, ma has made unknow unable to know his hidden depth, where the secret passions lie, must pray God that he be healed of these, while at the same time repenting on their account. 
Thus St. Barsanufius writes, Night and day I pray so as to be purified of the visible passions and of those which are hidden. Prayer, while simultaneously annihilating the passions, puts to flight those who are at their source and who in the soul are the main troublemakers and the cause of all its illnesses, the devil and his demons. It dispels all the pathological effects of their activity. In this regard, the Jesus prayer possesses a singular efficacy. Prayer's therapeutic effects are numerous and make themselves felt, firstly, on the mind, intellect, or the noose. Through prayer, the noose, which has been numbed and left dead by sin, is roused, becomes agile again, and begins to live anew, for there is its life. It ceases to be given over to the sensible world, in the world of vain representations, and finds itself again by engaging in the activity corresponding to its natural end goal. As Evagrius points out, quote, by its very nature, the spirit is made to pray, from his practicos, and prayer prepares the spirit to put its own powers into operation. And prayer is an activity which is appropriately appropriate to the dignity of the spirit, or better, it is appropriate for its nobler and adequate operation. Since the mind thus functions according to its nature, and since in its contemplation it avoids every representation of image or thought foreign to prayer, thus concentrating in prayer all its power of reflection and intellection, it regains all its strength and all its health, as Evagrius notes. Although in nature's fallen state, the noose is plagued by perpetual and extreme mobility, suffering from the ceaseless movement of the thoughts that agitate and trouble it and cause it to err. Prayer removes it, quote, from its customary distraction, its captivity and agitation, Callistos and Ignatius Zantopuli from Philokalia, collects it from its usual whirling and wandering and gives it steadfastness, establishing the noose in stability and firmness. This state is the result of the synergy realized in prayer of human effort and divine grace, the latter alone being able to allow man perfectly to master his noose's activity. This follows particularly from what St. John Climacus teaches, quote, instability is natural to the mind, but God is powerful to establish all things. If you persevere indefeatably in this labor, he who sets bounds to the sea of the mind will visit you too, and during your prayer will say to the waves, quote, Thus far shall you come and no further. Job 38.11 The spirit cannot be bound, but where the creator of the spirit is, everything obeys. Freed from all agitation, the mind the noose knows peace, true peace, and when it is united to the heart, communicates this peace to the whole soul and the body itself. However, one is dealing here not with the peace according to the flesh, accompanied by vanity and pride in which arises when the demons cease to besiege the soul, since it is accomplishing their will. Rather, at hand is the peace that comes from the spirit and is accompanied by humility and repentance. On the other hand, prayer contributes to this pacification of one's being by its power to dispel fear, particularly its most hidden and insidious form of anguish, whose deaf character makes it difficult to attack it head-on, anti rhetorically that is, by opposing it with arguments. Most often linked to direct demonic activity, it can only be conquered by prayer. Quote, Call upon me in the day of affliction, that is anguish, and I will deliver you, and you shall glorify me, says the Lord. Psalm 49, 15. God's might alone, invoked by man in prayer, can heal him of this dreadful illness that creeps into the, all the parts of the soul, and even into the body. It leaves the man given over to himself even more powerless, because this anguish is the source of his powerlessness. St. John Climacus, following the psalmist, also advises on this subject, 
from the latter, step 21.7, quote, flog your enemies with the name of Jesus, for there is no stronger weapon in heaven or earth. When you get rid of this disease, praise him who has delivered you. Prayer not only puts an end to the movement of thoughts, but also does away with their multiplicity, since by the attentive action it presupposes, it concentrates all thoughts into a single one, that of God, which becomes the single goal of all the soul's faculties. The mind then ceases to be divided into the many diverse thoughts it produced in its state of being abandoned to the sensible world. Likewise, the soul ceases to be pulled in all directions by its different faculties, which act according to manifold and incoherent starting principles, and all with different ends in mind. Through prayer is wrought the unification of the noose and the entire soul. As St. Macarius notes, the soul, turned into a dilapidated house by sin, regains beauty and order. Insofar as all of the soul's faculties participate in prayer, they cease to be given over to the sensible world and to function contra naturally. But when the mind is united to the heart, they turn to God and regain, by acting for him, the activity for which the Creator gave them to man, finding health anew in their functioning in conformity with their nature's end goal. Thus, as Evagrius notes, prayer, quote, restores health to the passionate part of the soul. That is to say, on the one hand, the desirative power, which ceases to covet sensible objects so as to desire God alone, and on the other, the aggressive power, which ceases to operate against one's neighbor or with the aim of obtaining the sensible objects coveted so as to take up the fight against the demons and thoughts, both bad thoughts and the simple thoughts that seek to distract the mind from prayer and turn it away from God. Prayer, excluding every representation and above all every image, no matter its nature so as to be pure, delivers man from the tyranny his imagination wielded against him and heals him of all the imagination's pathological manifestations. Prayer also heals the memory. In the state of sin, the memory is remembrance of the world and consequently forgetfulness of God, thus making itself sick along with all the faculties it turns away from the spiritual life. St. Hezekiah the priest writes from On Watchfulness and Holiness 32, Quote, as for forgetfulness and all its consequences, they can be cured by the most strict guarding of the noose and by the constant invocation of our Lord Jesus Christ. End of quote. From then on, the memory is transformed, becoming conversely in prayer forgetfulness of the world and its many thoughts and the memory of God. The footnote, this expression is frequently used, the memory of God by the Holy Fathers being found again and again in the Philokalia to designate prayer, particularly the Jesus prayer. To continue. Regaining health in this manner of operation that corresponds to its nature's end goal and makes the memory to be no longer alien in order to restore it to itself. In its natural state, the memory is simple, but as we have seen, Sin has brought about its fragmentization and division into multiple remembrances. In the simplicity of prayer, memory regains its natural and primal unity. Thus, St. Gregory the Sinite writes, quote, The remedy to deliver the original memory from the wicked and pernicious memory of thoughts is to the return to original simplicity. The great cure of the memory is the persevering and steadfast remembrance of God in prayer, end of quote. In this activity that suits its nature perfectly, the memory contributes to the healing of the entire soul, whose faculties it places again in God's presence. St. Daudokos of Fotiki explains from On Spiritual Knowledge and Discrimination, quote, It is a mark of one who truly loves holiness, that he continually burns up what is worldly in his heart, through practicing the remembrance of God, so that little by little evil is consumed in the fire of this remembrance, and his soul is completely 
recovers its natural brilliance with greater glory. End of quote. At the culmination of this process, Evagrius's assertion that pure prayer unites man to God coincides with that of St. Isaac the Syrian, that, quote, spiritual union is the memory in its pure state. End of quote, ascetical homily one. To continue, at the culmination of this process, Evagrius's assertion that pure prayer unites man to God coincides with that of St. Isaac the Syrian, as we said. The body does not remain deprived of prayer's therapeutic effects. Indeed, it participates in them along with the soul. It lends its own strength to prayer, adopting attitudes suitable for this activity and exercising its different faculties with the aim of fostering prayer. But the body itself also prays as it is able. And in conformity with the possibilities of its specific nature, notably through the making of matanya, prostrations. Footnote. Matanya are prostrations that accompany the vocal or mental recitation of certain prayer formula. A distinction is made between small matanya, consisting in bowing the head and the torso from the waist, and great matanya, consisting of a full body prostration with the hands and forehead touching the ground. To continue. Clement of Alexandria notes, quote, The body accompanies the impetus of the spirit. In this way, prayer contributes to the fulfillment of this recommendation of the apostle. Quote, I appeal to you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. Romans 12.1 Prayer is thus one of the activities common to the soul and the body. Gregory Palamas Triads particularly in hesychistic prayer, the Jesus prayer, in which the body, and especially its center, the heart, plays a fundamental role. The desire for God that manifests it in this purifies all the faculties and powers of the soul and the body. Through the purification of the soul, and in particular its impassioned part, the purification of the body is accomplished. Quote, the body then no longer moves under the impulse of the material and bodily passions, but comes to itself, rejecting every relation with wicked things. Like the soul, it acquires the inactivity of evil. Henceforth, man becomes receptive to grace in his entirety, both body and soul. The grace of the spirit is transmitted to the body through the intermediary of the soul and, quote, gives also to the experience of divine things, allowing it to experience the same thing as the soul, end of quote. Again from Palamas Triads. The body thus participates directly in the order, unification, and pacification that prayer establishes in the soul. Prayer, by involving the body, causes the body's different faculties to act with a single and self-same goal in mind, God. It therefore unifies the body within the body itself, but also reunifies it to the soul. Thanks to prayer, man regains the harmonious unity of his natural psychosomatic constitution, finding abolished within himself the separated state of soul and body, characteristic of fallen man. In prayer, the body ceases to be enslaved to the sensible world. St. Gregory Palamas says, Quote, it comes to itself, end of quote. In other words, it stops being alienated and sick by acting contranaturally and instead regains its true nature and recovers spiritual health by exercising its different faculties with God in mind, the true end goal of these faculties. Prayer through the concentration it demands really entails a guarding of the senses that turns the latter away from functioning according to the flesh. Likewise, all the other bodily faculties are healed by prayer, which causes them to move from an activity independent of God to one according to God. It allows the tongue to speak to God, but also of and in God, with peace, gentleness, courage, and wisdom, to the ears to make themselves attentive to the divine teachings, not only so as to hear them, but as David says, to remember his commandments and to do them. Additionally, our hands and feet 
are at the service of the divine will, thanks to prayer. What emerges from all the preceding is that prayer truly frees man, makes man free. It frees him from his fallen ego's limited and oppressive sphere so as to open him to God's infinity. By healing man of sin and the passions, it liberates him from enslavement to them and all their pathological effects. According to the apostle saying, man is, quote, set free from the bondage to decay, Romans 8.21. Prayer removes man from the state of alienation into which sin had placed him. Indeed, he ceases to be moved by exterior powers and to be subject to the law of sin dwelling within him, regaining in God his true being and thus truly acting of his own accord. The sole act of recovering his nature in God grants man freedom. For as St. Gregory of Nyssa recalls, the latter consists in identity with one's own nature and conformity with it. Prayer also makes man free because it reorientates his desire and will toward God, their natural aim, and because freedom further consists in, quote, the power of a deiform soul to direct itself by deliberate choice toward whatever it decides, as St. Diodokos of Photiki says. Finally, prayer frees man because through it he receives the light of the Spirit, which enlightening his intellect, his noose, delivers him not only from errors, but also from phantasms, illusions, and delusions imposed by sin and the passions on his cognitive faculties. Correlatively, this light, as we have seen, gives him to know the truth that frees him. John 8.31 According to the highest form of intellection, since in prayer man knows the real good and strives toward it without reflection and hesitation, his freedom here is not that which is imperfect and de deliberates, but that which is perfect, immediately and spontaneously moving toward the better. United to God through prayer and thus becoming a partaker of him, man enters into, quote, the glorious liberty of the children of God. Romans 8.21 by partaking of his energies, man becomes free with God's own freedom. Besides prayer's therapeutic effects, it is fitting to mention its many preventative ones as well. St. John Chrysostom says, quote, prayer is the guardian of health. And noting also, prayer is a great good, a salutary good, a good that guards our souls. The Holy Fathers frequently speak of it as an armor a shield, a refuge, and a rampart. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous man runs into it and is safe. Its preventative power manifests itself in two ways, as St. John Chrysostom points out. Quote, Prayer preserves our goods intact and promptly diverts ills. Generally speaking, prayer strengthens man. It is in fact the main source of every kind of strength he can acquire. St. John Climacus notes, quote, The power of a hesychist consists in abundance and riches of prayer. Above all else, prayer renders man able to confront temptations when the time comes and to resist them victoriously, thus allowing him to avoid a relapse into illnesses. Christ recommends, Quote, watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation, Matthew 26, 41. And, quote, pray that you may not enter into temptation, Luke 22, 40. Prayer's preventative power is so great that, quote, it is impossible that a man who prays with fitting fervor and who ceaselessly calls upon God should ever fall into sin. End of quote. John Chrysostom. Indeed, fervent prayer always obtains the help of divine might, which allows a man to confront any adversary. The battle against the temptations always comes down to a battle against the demons who suggest these temptations. Prayer strengthens man in light of this battle. This combat falls under the purview of the soul's aggressive power. Prayer provides it with the strength necessary to emerge victorious from the fight. But it also strengthens and makes prudent the mind which directs the operations of the aggressive power 
against the adverse powers to the soul's advantage. In the face of all his enemies' assaults, man thus becomes unshakable and outsmarts all their wiles, even the most subtle ones, rendering them utterly powerless. St. John Chrysostom teaches, quote, He who reckons with feeling of heart that he stands before God in prayer shall be an unshakable pillar, and none of the aforesaid demons will make sport of him. Henceforth, prayer protects man from all illnesses and all forms of madness, whose direct cause is the demons. It especially preserves him from the fearful anguish they seek to introduce into the soul. Prayer thus helps man to detach himself progressively from the world and from himself. For as St. Isaac the Syrian writes, quote, Prayer is the death of the thoughts that come from the will of the flesh. He who prays is like the dead man who is outside the world. To persevere in prayer is to renounce oneself. Ascetical Homily 69 Prayer causes man to triumph over his fallen nature and causes the old man to die in him. Similarly, it clothes him in the new man by uniting him to God, by its own act of conversing with God. Prayer brings about the sacrament of our union with God and grants us to know once again the closeness and boldness that characterized Adam's relationship with his creator in paradise. But prayer is also the union of the soul with God because it is the source of all virtues. It is primarily through the virtue of charity that prayer, more than any other spiritual attitude, has the power to inspire longing and to grow, allowing man to attach himself to God. St. Isaac the Syrian writes, quote, We pray so as to acquire the love of God. Indeed, we find in prayer the things that cause us to love God, Sedical Homily 35. He says further, quote, love is the fruit of prayer. And St. Maximus highlights the close link existing between love and pure prayer. Quote, he who truly loves God prays entirely without distraction, and he who prays entirely without distraction loves God truly. That's four centuries on charity. At any rate, Quote, when prayer penetrates the soul, every virtue enters with it. Consequently, man can regain through prayer the health of each of his faculties and of his whole being, and can delight in this state of the infinity of good things, whose source again seems to be prayer. Since through prayer the physician of souls purifies man's noose, soul and body, prayer is for the man one of the main ways of accessing spiritual knowledge. In healing man of the passions, the divine physician frees man from what prevented him from adequately knowing every reality, liberating him from what led him into error, produced all kinds of delusions in him, and totally plunged him into ignorance of what is essential. Purified of the passions, man becomes capable of illumination by the Holy Spirit. What was formerly incomprehensible to him now becomes understandable and comprehensible. First of all, man comes to know himself adequately. St. Hezekius the priest notes that prayer alone confers interior knowledge on man, on watchfulness and holiness. In this sense, St. John Cassianos considers it as an indication of one's condition. Elsewhere, he teaches, your prayer will show you what condition you are in. Theologians say that prayer is the monk's mirror. Indeed, in prayer, the Holy Spirit brings to man's awareness the things of which up to now he is unaware. He allows him to know his hidden depths, where the secret passions lie, while at the same time providing him with the means to remedy them. Evagrius writes, quote, just as the soul perceives its sick members as it operates by means of the body, so also the spirit, by praying, recognizes its own powers as it puts its own faculties into operation, and it is able to discover the healing commandment through experiencing the imped impediments to its free movement. End of quote. From Evagrius Practicus 82. To conclude, 
man can thus advance toward a total healing of his soul's illnesses and recover health. When man prays deeply, St. Peter Damascene notes, quote, Then the mind begins to see its sins like the sand of the sea. Here then is the beginning of the soul's illumination. Here then is the sign of its health. Similarly, Prayer allows man to attain to the knowledge of his true nature and to see himself in his spiritual reality of being an image of God. Henceforth, it appears as one of the main keys to adequate knowledge, not only of one's neighbor, but also of every reality. For to him who knows himself is given knowledge of all things. St. Isaac the Syrian, Ascetical Homily 16. And to know oneself is the fulfillment of of the knowledge of the universe, ascetical homily 16. At the same time as it allows man to know himself, prayer also grants him access, as we shall later see, to knowledge of God in the highest form it can take, that which God himself gives by his Spirit. B. The Method of Hesychistic Prayer Everything we have just said can be related to various forms of prayer, but most particularly and eminently concerns the Jesus Prayer, which occupies an essential place in Orthodox spirituality and is considered as the most complete form of prayer, containing the qualities of all the other forms. The Holy Fathers designate this type of prayer as prayer in the strict sense, setting it above the other forms of prayer and notably above psalmody. This prayer in its perfection maintains an essential link with contemplation, i.e. purification of the heart, illumination of the noose, and theosis or vision of God, so much so that we shall speak of it at the end of our study as the highest of all activities, to quote St. Gregory the Sinite from how the hesychist must stand in prayer. To continue. Yet at the same time as occupying the, the apex of spiritual life, this prayer appears as one of the latter's foundations and as one of the principal means that allow man, by God's grace, to be purified of his sins and healed of his passions and to acquire the virtues. As Saints Callistos and Ignatius Xanthopoli state, it is, quote, the beginning of the whole beloved work of God, end of quote. For this reason, it is not only justifiable, but also even necessary for us to speak of it at this point. The origins of this prayer have their roots in a practice going back to the dawn of monasticism. Certain fathers even ascribe an apostolic origin to it. And insisting in the unceasing mental or noetic repetition of a short formula of prayer, or monologia, or mono monological prayer, this brevity is supposed to encourage at once both the continuity of the prayer and the necessary collectedness so that it might be pure. Various short prayer formula have been used for this practice, but one of them has gradually come to dominate, beginning in the 5th through the 7th centuries. So much so that to be, has become the traditional formula of the Jesus prayer, quote, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me. End of quote. In this last form has finally gained a monopoly. It has so because of many advantages. A. It constitutes an appeal to God for help, mercy, and a full pardon. The Greek word for eleison has a broader scope of meaning than the English have mercy and includes the substance of the gospel formula of the prayers of the ten lepers. Luke 17:13 the blind man of Jericho Luke 18:38 and Mark 10:47 and the two blind men Matthew 20:31 and B it possesses a marked penitential character which is further enhanced when the word sinner is added to it following the example of the publican in Luke chapter 18 verse 13 it thus allows for the practical application of what we have seen to be one of Christ's very first commandments, repent. C. It is a confession of faith, which includes the main truths of the Christian faith. The affirmation that 
in Christ's single divine person are united the divine and human natures, that God is Trinity, and that Jesus Christ is the Savior. Indeed, by calling Jesus Christ Lord, the prayer confesses the unity of his person and his divinity. By calling him Jesus, it confesses his two natures, the divine and the human, in a single person and single hypostases. By calling him Son of God, it confesses him as the Father's only Son and again confesses his divinity. Through this last expression, it evokes the Father while simultaneously implying, imploring the Holy Spirit, since no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit, 1 Corinthians 12.3. Finally, by saying, Eles on me, have mercy on me, it implicitly confesses that Jesus Christ is the only Savior. For this reason, as the Russian pilgrim points out, quote, the fathers say that the Jesus prayer sums up the whole gospel from the way of a pilgrim. D. Through this very confession, the prayer is praise and worship. E. It includes the name of Jesus, which is attached to Christ's very hypostasis and personhood. It shares in his power, causing the man who calls upon him to participate in his energy and setting him in his presence, just as an icon places the one venerating it in the presence of the person depicted, making the former a, a participant of the energies it manifests. F. For this reason, this name that is above every name is particularly effective in fighting man's spiritual en enemies. St. John Clemacus' recommendation is well known. Quote, from step 21.7 and from Hezekiah the priest on watchfulness and holiness from Philokalia, flog your enemies with the name of Jesus, for there is no stronger weapon in heaven or on earth. End of quote. But it is equally effective in raising man up to the heights of the spiritual life. Being a short prayer, the he, the Jesus prayer, has two main advantages. A, easy to memorize and able to be said mentally, that is, noetically, simply, quickly, and in every situation. The prayer more easily allows for the fulfillment of Christ's commandment, quote, always to pray and not lose heart, Luke 18, 1. And the Apostle's recommendation, recalling it, quote, pray constantly, 1 Thessalonians 5, 17. The fathers took this command literally, seeking to realize in themselves a permanent and true state, a status of prayer, consisting of the act of uninterrupted prayer. To this end, the practice of the Jesus prayer consists in repeating the formula of the prayer as many times as possible, until it becomes as frequent as one's breathing or the beating of one's heart, and is therefore even in sleep. The continuous remembrance of God, as the Holy Fathers commonly call it. For this reason, St. John Climacus advises, quote, Take in with your very breath the word of him who said, He that endureth to the end shall be saved. Matthew 10.22 Let the remembrance of Jesus be present with every breath. And St. Hezekiah the priest, who himself propounds this recommendation several times in his well-known treatise on nipsis and holiness, watchfulness and holiness, states, The heart breathes and invokes endlessly and without ceasing only Jesus Christ, who is the Son of God and himself God. He also writes, quote, Truly blessed is the man whose mind and noose and heart are as closely attached to the Jesus prayer and to the ceaseless invocation of his name as air to the body or flame to the wax. End of quote. This repetition, done first aloud, and then mentally, silently, noetically, is accomplished in its perfected form spontaneously by the heart itself, whence the name prayer of the heart, which it is also sometimes accorded. B. Besides praying ceaselessly, man has the task according to the Apostle's recommendation of offering God a pure prayer, 2 Timothy 2.22. Herein lies the aim of that the Holy Father is assigned to every ascetic endeavor. And we shall later see that the knowledge, the theory or vision of God, 
the supreme goal of the Christian life is linked to such prayer. St. Isaac the Syrian notes, quote, all the forms that prayer can take have the purpose and end in pure prayer, ascetical homily 32. Later on, we shall see what pure prayer is in all the senses of this adjective. Here, though, we should like only to invoke its most basic meaning, which is linked to the very character of the Jesus prayer. One is dealing here with a prayer without distraction, a prayer unmingled with any thought foreign to its own content. This presupposes perfect mental concentration and the total gathering of all men's faculties. And as much as it is brief, the Jesus prayer lends itself to such concentration and that it keeps one's thought from being dispersed, distracted and fragmentized, and one's mind from being distracted as well, which with, which more easily risks being the case with a more developed prayer formula. The Jesus prayer thus responds perfectly to St. John Climacus' recommendation from step 28, quote, do not try to be verbose when you pray, lest your noose be distracted in searching for words. One word of the publican propitiated God, and one cry saved the thief. Loquacity in prayer often distracts the mind and the noose and leads to fantasy, whereas brevity makes for concentration. Moreover, St. John Climacus recalls St. Paul's teaching on this topic. A great practitioner of high and perfect prayer says, I would rather speak five words with my mind. First Corinthians fourteen nineteen. One will note that the shortened form of the prayer in Greek consists precisely of five words, Kyrie Isu Christe eleison me. However, the brevity of the prayer form used does not suffice to attain the concentration required. An array of spiritual, noetic, mental, and bodily attitudes are connected to the Jesus prayer, which should permit the one praying to attain undistracted prayer. The fathers link the practice of the prayer to a method. And one of the most well-known elements of it is a psychosomatic technique. Putting this technique to use presupposes several conditions. Isolation, silence, darkness, immobility, and a seated position. For more, see Nicky Foros, the monk on watchfulness, Theophilitos of Philadelphia on secret action, Simeon, the new theologian on the method of holy prayer and attention, Callistos and Ignatius, Xanthopoulis, Centuries, Gregory the Sinite on Hezekiah and the two modes of prayer, sit down on a low stool of half a cubit, and how the Hezekiah must be seated in prayer. To continue, the purpose of this technique is threefold. A, first to have the body participate in the prayer and to allow it also to receive the benefits that come from it. B, second, to foster the continuity of prayer by linking it to the rhythm of one's breathing. Several fathers thus advise one to link the first part of the prayer, Kyrie Isu Christe, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, with breathing in, and the second part, Eleison me, have mercy on me, or have mercy on me, a sinner, with breathing out. But different methods coexist exist on this point. C. Third, to help one concentrate, come to recollection, and to be attentive and watchful. Herein lies the main purpose the fathers assigned to this practice. Saints Callistos and Ignatius Xanthopouli note the Holy Fathers saw in these things merely an aid in gathering the mind and causing it to return to itself from its customary agitation and in bringing the attention back to it. To collect the noose means, in other words, to cause the mind, the noose, to return to the heart. In order to be understand what this means, one must know that the word heart in orthodox ascetical terminology refers to two realities, a spiritual one and a physical one. On the one hand, the heart, according to the main meaning of the term in the New Testament, designates the inner man, the whole of the soul's faculties, and more precisely, their root. 
It is man's ontological center, the center of his whole being, his very interior. It is identified with his person, his hypostases. On the other hand, according to its general meaning, heart designates the bodily organ of the same name. The Hezekist fathers have observed through experience that there exists an analogical correspondence between the spiritual heart and the physical heart the center of the body and source of its life. They also observe by virtue of the unity of soul and body within the human makeup, a connection which makes it so that the spiritual heart has its seat in the physical one. For more, see Gregory Palamas's Triads, Nikiforos the Monk on Watchfulness and Nicodemus the Hagiorite. And that what affects the one affects the other, even though by nature the spiritual heart is independent of the physical one. The mind, the noose itself, is one of the sp spiritual heart's organs. Ascetical homily 83, St. Isaac the Syrian. Indeed, the most important, with the result that it is sometimes called heart, metonymically, although the term eye of the heart, frequently ascribed to it, is more appropriate. Even though it is by nature bodiless and independent of the body, the noose nonetheless has its seat in the physical heart. Footnote, the union of the noose and the body and thus of the heart is felt as a fact of experience but is difficult to explain conceptually. For this reason, St. Gregory Palamas writes, I believe that we can speak of contact, of use, and of union that are produced here. However, no man can conceive and express the proper quality of these relationships between the spiritual nature and the bodily or the body from his triads. To continue, however, the noose is usually separated from the heart, scattering and dispersing itself in thoughts outside the heart and hence outside itself. There is no contradiction in this, for the mind, the noose, by its nature or essence, has its seat in the heart, but by its activity, it can distance itself from the heart more precisely, by the one of its act two activities, which St. Dionysius the Areopagite calls movement in a straight line, and which corresponds to the exercise of the reason whose organ is the brain. The second of these activities, which Dionysius calls circular, is its most excellent and fitting activity. In this activity, the mind the noose does not extend to the exterior, but enters again into itself, comes to itself, and remains united to the heart. Thus it is kept sheltered from every deviation. It is important for prayer to correspond to the second activity of the noose. In order for the noose to dedicate itself exclusively to this activity, the first kind must cease. In other words, one must, quote, gather together again the noose scattered without and lead it within again. One must cause the noose to re-enter the heart and then keep it there. The Hezekiah's fathers, basing themselves on the relationship which, as we've seen, unites the physical heart to the spiritual one, recommend the psychosomatic method, which should allow the practitioner more easily to attain to the confining of his incorporeal being within his bodily house, as St. John Climacus says in step 27. One, first of all, this method consists in bowing one's head and resting the chin on the chest, so as to concentrate one's sight with eyes closed on the place of the heart, or as St. Simeon the New Theologian recommends, on the navel. St. Gregory Palamas justifies this practice thus, quote from triad number one, the man who seeks to turn his noose back into itself need not propel it in a straight line, but into the circular motion. He will not only collect himself outwardly, but will conform himself to the interior movement that he seeks for his mind. In addition, by taking this posture with the body, he will send the force of the noose, which otherwise escapes through the sight, back into the interior of the heart. End of quote. Two, on the other hand, it is a matter of slowing down one's rate of breathing, of holding one's breath a bit in such a way 
so as not to breathe with ease. This practice has four reasons. A. As St. Gregory the Sinite observes, quote, the breathy tempest which rises from the heart obscures the mind, the noose, and agitates the soul, distracts it, delivers it captive to forgetfulness and neglect, or even makes it mull all sorts of things over and over again, one after the other, casting it senselessly into what is unnecessary. Gregory the Sinite on Hezekiah and the two modes of prayer. To continue, Dr. Larche writes, If breathing freely contributes to the noose's dispersion, breathing in a restrained manner, on the contrary, disciplines it. One can observe, as St. Gregory Palamas points out, that, quote, The in-and-out movement of the breath becomes peaceful at any time of intense reflection, especially in those who practice Hezekiah and stillness in body and thought. Conversely, the slowing down of one's breathing aids in recollecting the noose. B. Restraining the breath at the same time as, the as putting the body in an uncomfortable position produces a certain discomfort and even a certain pain, which, according to the Holy Fathers, has beneficial effects. On the one hand, even this aching contributes to recollection. St. Nicodemus the Hagiorite explains, quote, By holding your breath... The heart is pressed and troubled and feels pain from not receiving natural oxygen. The noose, however, is much more readily compelled to return to the heart, not only because of the pain, but also because of the pleasure in the heart. On the other hand, St. Nicodemus points out that, quote, through this pain, the heart expels the poisonously baited hook of pleasure and sin, which had been previously swallowed and thus you have the therapy of action and reaction, according to the physicians. See, as St. Nicodemus the Hagiorite notes further, quote, By holding the breath, the usually hard and thick heart is somewhat refined and warmed through this slight suffering. Consequently, it becomes soft, sensitive, humble, and more capable of contrition and tears. At the same time, the mind of the noose becomes more refined in its activity, more refined, more clear, end of quote. D. St. Nicodemus explains, quote, This controlling of the breathing also unites all the powers of the soul to return to the noose and through the noose to God, end of quote. In other words, the method contributes here to unite all the faculties in prayer, direct them toward God so that man becomes entirely prayer and thus entirely united to God. Three, finally, the psychosomatic method consists in uniting the noose to the breath, compelling it to enter the chest along with the breath all the way to the place of the heart. Syndicophoros the Hezekis thus advises, quote, concentrate your intellect and lead it into the respiratory passage through which your breath passes into your heart. Put pressure on your noose and compel it to descend into your heart along with your inhaled breath. End of quote, on watchfulness and guarding of the heart. Saints Callistos and Ignatius Zansopuloi rec likewise recommend, quote, concentrate your noose away from its usual whirling and wandering. Gently push it down into the interior of the heart through the inhaled breath and hold within it the prayer, Kyrie Isu Christe Eleis on me. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. Let us note that in every instance, this technique must be practiced under the guidance of an experienced spiritual father, preferably a Yeronda, since otherwise one runs the risk of bringing on serious bodily or mental troubles. Having presented the principles of the psychosomatic method, we must stress that this method is not absolutely necessary and only plays an auxiliary role. The fathers regard it essentially as an introductory tool and above all intended for beginners, acknowledging the possibility of achieving the same result by another route. Thus, St. Nikiforos, one of the main proponents of this method, writes from On Watchfulness, quote, If, however, in spite of all your efforts, you are not able to enter the realms of the heart in the way that I have enjoined, do what I now tell you, and with God's help you will find what you seek. Banish, then, 
all thoughts from this faculty of reason, logic. And you can do this if you want to. And in their place, put the prayer, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, and compel it to repeat this prayer ceaselessly. If you continue to do this for some time, it will assuredly open for you the entrance to your heart in the way we have explained, and as we ourselves know from experience. End of quote. In any case, no method can be considered as a technique capable of producing spiritual effects of its own accord, since they can only be the fruit of divine grace. What is important in order to receive this grace are the faith and fervor that man manifests toward God in prayer, not the method itself, which is only an aid and has a role limited to facilitating Nipsey's attentiveness and watchfulness. The physical method facilitates the mind's access to the heart, but it still does not make such access easy. In every case, only after much time and after putting forth great effort can one attain to ceaseless and pure prayer of the heart. Furthermore, it must be stated that herein lies a grace that only the rarest of spiritual men reach. Scarcely one in every generation, as St. Isaac the Syrian says in Ascetical Homily 32, in truth, the Jesus prayer is inextricably linked to the whole of the ascetic life, of which it is at once the beginning and end. As a mode of prayer, this prayer, like every other form of prayer, is the prerequisite for this life. In turn, as the Jesus prayer, in its full perfection and permanent, is permanent, pure prayer, presupposing the whole of the ascetic life as a prerequisite, it requires that all the stages of praxis, action and purification, be successfully completed. In light of these spiritual requirements, the psychosomatic method appears to be secondary and would be useless apart from this combination of conditions. Among the necessary accompanying conditions to the Jesus prayer, we must first mention Nipsey's watchfulness. Through watchfulness, which we shall study later on, are simultaneously accomplished the guarding of the heart and the guarding of the mind or the noose. The former's function is to purify the heart of every impassioned thought, every passionate movement, while the latter's function to purify the noose of every representation, be it thought or image, foreign to the prayer's content. Likewise, one must mention compunction, humility, and the love of God, to which the Holy Fathers accord an essential and necessary role. But it must be stressed that the practice of the Jesus prayer requires that the fight against all the passions be simultaneously waged until dispassion or impassibility is attained, and that all the other correlative virtues be put into practice. In other words, the Jesus prayer is an integral part of the active keeping of all the divine commandments. 5. The Remedy of the Commandments Faith, repentance, and prayer, in conjunction with the reception of the sacraments, do not suffice for man's salvation and deification if they are not accompanied by the fulfillment of the divine commandments. The Holy Scriptures and all of tradition constantly remind us that in order for faith to have a real impact and be fully actualized, it must be demonstrated in the keeping of the Holy Commandments. The Holy Apostle James teaches, quote, So faith by itself, if it has no works, is dead. James 2.17 And, quote, for the, As the body apart from the spirit is dead, so faith apart from works is dead. And faith apart from works is barren. And man is justified by works and not faith alone. James 2.24 St. Isaac repeats this teaching, quote, Faith also has need of works. In his ascetical homily 22, St. John Damascene writes in the same vein, quote, Faith is made perfect by all that Christ instituted, by honoring and keeping his commandments. St. Simeon the New Theologian teaches, quote, May no one proceed to trust himself exclusively to faith in Christ. He goes on to say, as far as Quote, they are faithless who base themselves solely on faith. 
St. Mark the ascetic goes so far as to liken faith in Jesus to the keeping of his commandments. And St. John Chrysostom, after likewise saying that faith alone does not suffice to be saved, states more clearly, To this faith must be joined the ordering of all one's life and the changing of one's lifestyle. In this resolution to order his being in life according in accordance with Christ's commandments, man concretely demonstrates his will to be healed and saved. He shows that his healing and salvation are not for him merely the object of a simple wish, but that he yearns for them with all his being and in his life by really setting out on the paths leading to them. Repentance, change of direction, which along with faith is one of the foundations of salvation, so much so that Christ inaugurates and closes his public mission by preaching it, is not only regret over a past or present sinful state, but also the willingness to turn away from this and change one's life. This is one of the connotations of the word metania. The keeping of the commandments appears then as the necessary extension of repentance, if not one of its essential attributes. Likewise, Though prayer is fundamental, it does not suffice for man's salvation. As Christ himself teaches, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Matthew 7.22 Man's prayer is heard only on condition that he put God's commandments into action. Quote, And we receive for him whatever we ask, because we keep his commandments and do what pleases him. End of quote. 1 John 3.22 as Origen notes, quote, faithfulness to Christ's precepts thus forms an integral part of prayer. Baptism itself is nothing without the keeping of the commandments. For if man receives the fullness of grace through baptism, the sacrament only manifests itself to the degree that man keeps commandments. St. Mark the ascetic writes, quote, holy baptism is perfect, but does not perfect him who does not put the commandments into practice. End of quote. Elsewhere, he states more clearly, Grace has been mystically given to those who have been baptized into Christ. It is shown to be efficacious in proportion to the keeping of the commandments. And if we do not put God's commandments into practice, the grace that has been given to us does not reveal itself. End of quote. Saints Callistos and Ignatius Zentopuli similarly explain well, Christ, being perfect God, has given to the baptized the perfect grace of the Holy Spirit, to which we have nothing to add. But this grace is revealed and manifested to us to the extent that we fulfill the commandments. By themselves the commandments neither save nor deify man, for the believer is saved and deified by grace, which is God's gift. Ephesians 2, 8-9 Yet, at the same time, the keeping of the commandments is indispensable for man's salvation and deification, for by such keeping is man able to preserve the grace received in the sacraments. He can take it unto himself and grow in it, not to mention regain it, should he have distanced himself from this grace. Just as the divine commandment in paradise helped Adam to re remain on the path to deification unto which God had set him from the moment of his creation, allowing him to preserve his nature in its original state. So also is the first function of Christ's commandments to keep the baptized, preserve himself in his condition of the new man and to safeguard the gifts acquired. St. Simeon the New Theologian notes, quote, God's grace is preserved by the observation of the commandments. Such a preservation in any case occurs objectively. But in order that man might personally assume it and really apply it to his life, his assent, free participation, and voluntary cooperation are necessary. For God, if he gives us his grace, neither imposes it on us nor forces our will, but respects our freedom. Through the keeping of the commandments, this participation and this cooperation on the part of man can be made manifest. St. Peter of Damascus notes that through Christ's divine commandments, quote, the baptized person guards the grace of the Holy Spirit if only he wishes to observe them. The commandments thus help man to protect the spiritual health he has regained by keeping himself pure of every evil and by persevering in the new life into which he has been led. 
For this reason, St. Mark the ascetic writes, quote, Let us, who have had the honor of receiving the laver of the new birth, do good, not so as to give something in recompense for it, but so as to keep pure the gift that has been given unto us. Elsewhere he explains further, quote, To those who have received the power to keep the commandments as believers, it is prescribed to have to fight so as not to go back, so as never to again return to sin. The psalmist stresses this preventative function of the commandments several times. Quote, I shall not be put to shame, having my eyes fixed on all thy commandments. Psalm 118. And the wicked have laid a snare for me, but I do not stray from thy precepts. And great peace have those who love thy law. Nothing can make them stumble. St. Diodocus of Photiki writes in the same vein, quote, For if we had not ceased from the remembrance of God and neglected his holy commandments, we would have not have succumbed to either voluntary or involuntary sin. Additionally, the commandments must in no way be thought of as obligations, much less as prohibitions or taboos of a legalistic sort. No, but rather as guardrails that prevent whoever follows them from returning to the pit of sin and falling back into the spiritual illnesses, namely the passions. St. Simeon the New Theologian subtly points out that it is more a matter of being kept safe by the commandments than by keeping them oneself. See his Ethical Treaties, Volume 2. Meanwhile, the commandments deserve their name for the attitudes and behaviors they prescribe if they correspond, as we shall see, to the deep and true nature of the man restored in them by holy baptism and chrismation, are nevertheless not spontaneous, insofar as they contradict the predispositions of man's fallen nature and environment. Here from Romans chapter 7, verses 21 to 23, quote, So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God, in my inmost self, but I see in my members another law at which at war with the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin which dwells in my members. The commandments allow the baptized person not only to preserve the gifts received, but also to make them grow in him and have the talents given him by the Spirit bear fruit. Man's spiritual life after baptism and chrismation must really be a life of development, progress, and growth accomplished through the Spirit even so far as acquiring the stature of mature manhood in Christ, Ephesians 4.13, and actualizing the perfect likeness to God. This growth takes the form of an ever greater and ever more profound appropriation and assimilation of the grace received in the sacraments, a work for which the keeping of the commandments is absolutely necessary. St. Macarius the Great writes, quote, Whoever wishes to obtain from God the heavenly grace of the Spirit, to grow and become perfect in the Holy Spirit, must force himself to keep all God's commandments. End of quote. Indeed, the assimilation of grace, its appro- appropriation and fruitification, requires man's active cooperation with the Spirit's activity. This entails not only his free ascent, but also his real participation through all his being's faculties, in all his life's activities, in all the spheres of his existence, which fulfills the keeping of the commandments. Without this participation, grace is not external to man, but merely appears to be so. He cannot unite himself to it, develop himself in and through it, or cause it to be living and active for himself. He cannot make it fully operative in his being or be transformed by it. He cannot concretely and really manifest it in his actions and in his life. Nonetheless, the effects of grace, fully and objectively present in him, only make themselves felt to him in proportion to the attention and zeal he puts forth in fulfilling the commandments and the aptitude he displays for living in concrete conformity to them. Thus, St. Simeon, the new theologian, notes that those who do not experience the effects of baptism are, quote, infirm for lack of keeping the commandments. As we've seen, St. Mark the ascetic never ceases to repeat that man receives the fullness of grace at baptism, but that he receives it mystically 
and that this grace is only truly revealed, only manifests its effects in him in proportion to his keeping of the commandments. The perfect grace of the Spirit has been given to us, so it cannot grow in us, rather we must grow in it. The saint writes, quote, Holy baptism is perfect with regard to us, but we are not perfect with regard to it. You then, O man baptized in Christ, must simply exercise the power you have received and prepare yourself for the intimate manifestation of him who dwells in you. And for this reason, the action of the Spirit produces its particular fruits in us to the extent that we, with faith, put the commandments into practice. Only by keeping the commandments can we may be made a son of God. See, Luke 20, 36, Romans 8, 14, and Galatians 3, 26. By adoption and a God by grace, St. Peter Damascene writes, Through grace God has given to all the power to become children of God by observing the divine commandments. The commandments are the expression of God's will, fully revealed and perfectly fulfilled by Christ. By living in conformity with them, man ceases to accomplish his own will, which isolates him and makes him a stranger to God. Instead, he accomplishes God's will, and by so doing, likens himself to the divine, becoming in all things obedient to the Father. He thus becomes a brother to Christ. Quote, Whoever does the will of God is my brother. End of quote. Mark 3.35 One can also say, that the commandments make of man a son of God by adoption, because through them man adopts a comportment worthy of a son with regard to his father by truly, concretely, and ontologically bearing witness to his faith in him. St. Paul proclaims, For in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God through faith. Galatians 3.26 And also to his love for him, for the love of God consists in keeping his commandments. John 14.15 Christ teaches, he who has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. Responding to this love of a son for his father are the father's love for his adopted son and the son's love for his adopted brother. Quote, he who loves me will be loved by my father and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Through the sending of the Holy Spirit, Christ manifests himself and the father to him who witnesses his love for God by keeping his commandments. Who, if you love me, you, you will be keeping my commandments. And I will pray that the Father and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever, even the spirit of truth. John 14, verse 15 and following. Henceforth, the faithful can exclaim with the psalmist, I pant because I long for thy commandments. The commandments thus appear as the source of of the sanctification and deification wrought in man by the Holy Spirit. For by keeping them, man opens himself up to the Holy Spirit's action, being united through this to Christ, and in him to the Father. One can thus describe the commandments, as do Saints Callistos and Ignatius, as deifying, and hold to Saint Simeon the New Theologian's view that the baptized acquire sanctity by keeping the commandments. Saint Isaac the Syrian writes categorically, he who has not kept the commandments and has not followed in the blessed apostles' footsteps is not worthy of being called a saint. St. Peter Damascene even goes so far as to say that the commandments are the grace of God. And St. Mark the ascetic goes so far as to write, The Lord keeps himself hidden in his own commandments and is found to the degree that one seeks him. Do not say, I have kept the commandments and have not found the Lord. All this must be understood in conjunction with the considerations above, but also with the awareness that the commandments are not a legal code, nor a collection of abstract moral prescriptions that are defined theoretically, or even elaborated on the basis of some human experience, however remarkable it may be, nor again precepts of the same nature as those that the wise of this world teach, and which St. Paul urges us to distrust, quote, see to it that no one makes a prey of you by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the universe. Colossians 2.8 
Christ himself, the Theanthropos, the God-man stresses the basic emptiness and insanity of the latter by saying of those professing them, quote, in vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the precepts of men. These precepts cannot save, for they are only human. Put not your trust in sons of men, in whom there is no salvation, says the psalmist. Psalm 145, verse 3. Christ's commandments, on the contrary, have saving and deifying power because they are by nature theanthropic, being founded on the very person of the Son of God, become man. Thus St. Paul opposes what is, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the universe, with what is, according to Christ, immediately adding, for in him the full whole, whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. After previously saying, As therefore you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so live in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, just as you were taught. In giving the commandments, Christ not only gives precepts, but himself fulfilling them perfectly also shows through his words and deeds and his whole manner of being the archetype of human be attitudes and behaviors in their perfect, totally healthy, and holy, that is, theanthropic form. In his person, in which he has united human nature to divine nature, he has us behold the true man, the new man, Ephesians 2.15, created after the likeness of God, Ephesians 4.24, which is being renewed after the image of its creator, Colossians 3.10. The new Adam, not only restored, but also made perfect through this fully realized union with God. The Lord also permits us, if we keep these commandments ourselves, to conform ourselves truly to him, to be fully like him, to be imitators of God. Ephesians 5.1 Not superficially as one might imitate a wise man or a hero, but rather by putting on Christ. Galatians 3.27 Communing with his deified humanity and being made partakers of the divine nature. 2 Peter 1.4 The scholar of the Questions to Thalassius writes quite clearly, the word of God, the Logos, reveals himself by taking form in the commandments and those who make use of praxis. And it is through the commandments that he leads those who act to the Father in his person of the word. End of quote. Through the combination of keeping of the commandments and the reception of the divine sacraments, we can live by means of the divine life. The Lord teaches, quote, if you would enter life, keep the commandments, Matthew 19, 17, saying further, the Father's commandment is eternal life, John 12, 50. We can exclaim with the psalmist, I will never forget thy precepts, for by them thou hast given me life. And with the apostle, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me, Galatians 2, 20. Since the keeping of the commandments allows us to be assimilated to Christ through the Holy Spirit and in Christ to have access to the Father, it grants us to attain a true knowledge of God. The psalmist frequently evokes the direct link between the keeping of the commandments and knowledge of the truth. Quote, I have chosen the way of truth and have not forgotten thy judgments. Teach me knowledge, for I have believed thy commandments. I have gained understanding through thy commandments which means not only that the commandments are true, but also that, by, that they proceed from and lead to the truth. Later, we shall see that the keeping of the commandments allows man to attain even the highest form of knowledge, the radiant and deifying vision of God, which is brought about by the Holy Spirit and those who are worthy of receiving this gift. If such knowledge is reserved for the perfect, nonetheless, nevertheless, as St. Simeon the New Theologian notes, God reveals himself and makes himself known to some degree to all who keep his commandments according to the capacity of each. In any case, the keeping of the commandments remains the sole criterion of all true knowledge of God, as the Holy Apostle John stresses, quote, and by this we may know and be sure that we know him if we keep his commandments. He who says, I know him, but disobeys him is a liar and the truth is not in him, 1 John 2.3, especially the keeping of the first two commandments, 
love of God, and love of one's neighbor, which, moreover, sum up all the other commandments, grants us access to the knowledge of God, since God is love. Quote, he who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. 1 John 4, 7. If the role of the commandments is to allow the baptized person to preserve the gifts received and to cause them to bear fruit, it is also their role to allow him to regain these gifts to the degree that he has distanced himself from them, having voluntarily given himself over to sin and the passions after baptism. St. Mark the ascetic explains that man, after being baptized, is perfectly purified of every sin and freed of every passion. If he falls again, this is only on account of his negligence in keeping the commandments, which alone would have allowed him to be in harmony with the grace received and truly to acquire this purity that has been granted to him. Accordingly, man can quite naturally regain this purity and make it his own, and in general recover all the gifts received at baptism by beginning to keep the commandments. Saints Callistos and Ignatius teach similarly to Saint Mark. Quote, the beginning of everything accomplished in God is to strive in every way and with all our might to live according to the laws of all the deifying commandments of the Savior. The end and the fruit is to return to the perfect grace of the Spirit which has been given to us through baptism and which is in us. But grace is covered up by the passions. It is uncovered by the work of the divine commandments. Through the fulfillment of all these commandments, in so far as possible, it is our job to endeavor by all means to radiate forth in us the manifestation of the Spirit, and to behold this quite clearly. End of quote from Century. To continue, from this perspective, the Fathers highlight the commandments purifying function with regard to sin and the passions. Thus, St. Dorotheus of Gaza writes, quote, Knowing our weaknesses and foreseeing that even after baptism we would still commit sin, God in his goodness has given us holy commandments that purify us. Therefore, if we desire it, we can be purified again by keeping the commandments. By purifying man of all evil and by causing him to regain the grace within him, the commandments restore to him in this way his original nature's spiritual health, which he recovered through baptism. St. Isaac the Syrian says, from his letter number four, You know that sin entered us through the transgression of the commandments. It is clear then that health returns through the keeping of the same commandments. If we do not apply ourselves to this task, if from the outset we do not tread this path leading to purity, we ought neither to desire nor to hope for the soul's purification. And do not tell me that even without the work of the commandments, God can give us purification of the soul by grace. End of quote. He points out that Christ's coming would had but one aim, to purify the soul, to remove from it the evil of the first transgression, to return it to its original healthy state. He has given us the commandments so as to heal us of our passions. It is obvious that the commandments are there to fight the passions and heal the soul that has transgressed. Elsewhere, he notes, likewise, quote, the soul receives health through the observance of the law. May the man who, through the fulfillment of the commandments and by the toughest feats of the true life, has conquered the passions knows that he receives health of soul through observing the law. End of quote. St. Gregory Palamas says similarly, only by fulfilling God's commandments does the soul acquire health, and the health and perfection of the soul are only accomplished in love and the observation of his commandments. End of quote from Triads. From this we see that the fathers consider the commandments as remedies in the proper sense of the word, acknowledging that they have a therapeutic function and value of the highest importance. For St. Simeon the New Theologian, they are the remedies man applies to his soul that is sick with the passions. The same is true for St. Maximus the Confessor, who writes, By means of his prescriptions, the physician of souls administers the remedy according to the cause of the passions that lie hidden in the soul. End of quote. Four centuries on charity. St. Isaac the Syrian similarly agrees, 
The Lord has given us the commandments as remedies so as to purify us of the passions and of sins. And the commandments are to the passionate soul what remedies are to the sick body. And the hidden working of the commandments heals the power of the soul. The spiritual commandments, the commandments that the soul keeps in meditation on the fear of God, renew and sanctify the soul and treat all its members in secret. It is clear that each of the commandments gently heals every passion in the soul. He who is healed and he who heals feels this energy just as did the woman with the flow of blood. Likewise, for St. John Chrysostom, the law is the cure of the soul. And for St. Gregory Nazazine, a gentle and humane medicine which Christ has given us so as to support us preferring this to a severe treatment that would not have required our participation. Clement of Alexandria writes, quote, from his pedagogue, The word has been called Savior, he who developed these spiritual remedies for men so as to give them a just sense of morality and lead them to salvation. He prescribes what man must abstain from and brings to the sick all the salutary antidotes. When a phys physician gives no remedy for health, the sick complain. How could we not have the greatest gratitude for the divine pedagogue, since he does not keep silent and does not neglect to point out the shortcomings leading to ruin, but on the contrary, he denounces them, and he teaches precepts suitable to the right life. End of quote. St. Dorotheus of Gaza likewise points out that Christ, quote, provides us with the remedy for the transgression of the divine precepts in order that we might be saved. He stresses in his teaching the preeminent value of the physician, Christ, and the remedies, the commandments that are at the disposal of the Christian who, as the saint says, has no excuse if he does not obtain healing. Quote, we find various reasons for the weakness of the body. Either the remedies do not work because they are too old, or the physician is inexperienced and gives one remedy instead of another, or the sick person is disobedient and does not observe his prescriptions. But it is not so in the soul's case. We certainly cannot say that the physician lacks experience and has not given the fitting remedies. Since the physician of our souls is Christ, who knows everything and who gives to each passion the appropriate cure, I mean the commandments. This physician then is not inexperienced. On the other hand, one also cannot say that the remedies are ineffective because they are too old. Christ's commandments never grow old. In fact, the more they help, the more they are made new. Thus, there is no other obstacle to the soul's health than its own lack of discipline. End of quote. The keeping of the commandments heals man of his passions, first of all, by healing his faculties of the perversion from which, as we have seen, these passions are born. St. Dorotheus of Gaza notes that, quote, God has given us precepts that purify us of our inner man's wicked predispositions. And St. Philotheus of Sinai writes more clearly, quote, It is evident that all the commandments of the gospel legislate for the tripartite soul, that is, the desirative, irascible, and rational faculties, and make it healthy through what they enjoin. They do not merely seem to make it healthy, but they actually have this effect. In like manner, Evagrius asks, quote, Who knows the might of the God's commandments, and who understands the soul's faculties, and how the former heal the latter? Since man's spiritual illnesses were formed by his turning away from God, their healing takes the form of man's return to God, of the reorientation toward God of all his faculties, in all the attitudes and activities of his existence. Through the keeping of the commandments, such a straightening out of men's paths is brought about. He can renounce the distractions to which his sin had borne him away and lead a right life, an orthodox life, that is, a life in full conformity with God's will. The psalmist speaks thus of this, quote, How shall a young man, that is, the man who has not attained the stature of mature manhood in Christ, correct his way by keeping thy words? Psalm 118.9 and teach me good judgment, for I have believed thy commandments. I have hated every unjust way. St. Isaac the Syrian notes in the same way, Christ has given 
the law of the commandments so as to straighten out the soul. Sadako Homily 37. Stressing this operative end goal of the commandments and rejecting every formalistic regard for or keeping of them, which would not have the effect of transforming man, he goes as far as to write, quote, Christ demands less the work of the commandments than the setting aright of the soul. By reorganizing his being and bringing it into conformity with God, man accomplishes what he was created for. He actualizes his nature's normal end goal. He is and does what he can best be and do. He progresses toward the perfection to which God calls him. He becomes adequate to his true nature. This is the nature Adam possessed in paradise but had altered through his sin, the nature that Christ gave back to mankind by bringing it to its fulfillment in himself, the nature that man himself has put on by being baptized, albeit with the task of personally assimilating such nature to himself. There is a close correlation between man's true nature and the nature of the commandments God gives him, which once again shows that the latter are in no way abstract principles or theoretical demands, ideals with no relation to man's needs, possibilities, and destiny, but rather correspond on a deep level to what he is in essence, as St. Gregory Palamas explains. From his homilies, quote, When the Lord, who made our hearts and knows everything, came down to the flesh on earth by causing us to be reborn and saving us who had fallen, he demanded from us what he had placed in our souls from the beginning, at the moment of creation. Indeed, he created man from the beginning in such a way that we might be adequate to the teaching he would give afterwards on earth. This is why now, when he has come to earth, he has given the sort of commandments that correspond to our nature created by him in the beginning. Homily 40. To continue, Henceforth, the commandments exist as a means given by Christ to man so as to allow him to recover his authentic nature and his original state of health. In other words, so as to live according to the virtues. For we have seen that the virtues belong to man's very nature and are constitu constitutive of his health. In sum, the commandments are very closely related to the virtues, since their function is to eliminate what hinders the latter, to wit, the sins and passions, to preserve these virtues once they have been recovered, and to guarantee their growth and lead them to perfection. St. Thalassius writes, quote, The causes of the virtues are the commandments. End of quote. In like manner, St. Simeon the New Theologian writes, quote, From the fulfillment of the commandments are born the virtues. Through the fulfillment of the commandments, the implementation of the virtues comes about. End of quote from Catechesis. And finally, the keeping of the commandments and a life according to the virtues are identical with one another, for the virtues correspond to the fulfillment of the commandments. St. Simeon notes further, quote, The fullness of the commandments is brought about by the practice of the virtues. Sedical homily number 37. 6. The remedy of hope. Hope is another basic condition of man's spiritual healing and his salvation. God saves those who hope in him, says the prophet Daniel, Daniel 1360. And the holy apostle writes, quote, For in this hope we were saved. Romans 8.24 Along with faith and charity, hope is one of the three cardinal virtues containing all the others and guaranteeing their union. See St. John Clemacus, the latter, step 30. Clement of Alexandria says that hope, along with faith and charity, is one of the links of health and salvation. Hope consists in waiting for what one desires and does not yet have to manifest itself. Or as St. John Chrysostom says, in quote, waiting for what one does not immediately receive, in waiting with confidence without ever becoming discouraged. End of quote from his commentary on Psalm 146. This presupposes the virtue of perseverance, the form of patience to which hope is so closely linked. Quote, if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience, writes the apostle. Christian hope has God himself as its object particularly Christ, the God-man, Theanthropos, the author of our salvation, who sends us the Holy Spirit and gives us access to the Father, quote, Christ Jesus, our hope, 
1 Timothy 1.1. Hope consists primarily in the confident awaiting of salvation and future blessings. In particular, the resurrection, eternal life, and the vision of God's glory. For as the Holy Apostle says, quote, If for this life only we have hoped in Christ, we are of all men most to be pitied. 1 Corinthians 15, 19. If hope consists in awaiting the fullness of these goods in the age to come, nevertheless, it also consists in awaiting their first fruits here below. For this reason, the Apostle Peter writes for his part, quote, Set your hope fully upon the grace that is coming to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ, 1 Peter 1.13. Hope can thus generally be defined as the expectation of good things, or on condition that one be dealing not with the goods of this world, but with spiritual goods, the divine goods, by which we are saved and deified. For hope does not look, quote, to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen, which are eternal, 2 Corinthians 4.18. Hope, then, also consists in awaiting from God the help one needs, in the certainty that he will not fail to provide it according to his word, quote, I will not fail you nor forsake you. This hope is precious when every way out of the gravest illness and the deepest distress appears shut, as St. Peter Damascinos highlights, quote, hope in God and he will act in some way he will act. In his love for man, he will open through hope another way of which you are unaware, so as to save your captive soul. Only neglect not him who can heal you. End of quote. Hope in this case is all the more necessary since man does not always receive divine assistance right when he asks for it. Here in particular, perseverance is shown to be close to hope, which appears as the capacity to, quote, remain steadfast amid evils. More generally speaking, hope consists in awaiting every good thing exclusively from God, and thus in giving oneself over to God alone in every need and concern, and expecting from this world no good thing, nor any help on the part of men, and furthermore, in not placing one's trust in oneself. St. Isaac the Syrian stresses that in this, True and spiritual hope is distinguished from false and misplaced hope. See ascetical homily 22. From hope according to this world. Thus St. Barsanufius advises, quote, Placing your hope in him, do not be anxious about tomorrow. Matthew 6.34 For it is for him to take care of us. And if we cast all our cares on him, 1 Peter 5.7, He himself will care for us as he wills. End of quote. By placing this hope in God, man cannot be dismayed. For as the Apostle says, that hope does not disappoint, Romans 5.3. Whereas every other object of hope would be subject to the instability of the things of this world and would in general way be dependent on their limits, the hope in the divine good things is solid, sure, and safe from all change. St. John Chrysostom says, quote, If you have been mistaken, is because you have not hoped as you should have. Because you have ceased to hope, you have not awaited the end. You have been weak. Henceforth, act otherwise. Hope is closely linked to faith, as the author of the letter to Barnabas states, in its principle. Faith presupposes hope, since, as St. Paul says, it is the assurance of things hoped for, Hebrews 11.1. 1. In addition, as St. Simeon the New Theologian points out, for whoever is without hope is, by the same token, without faith. Men would not truly believe in him who can heal and save him if he did not hope to receive healing, health, and salvation from him. Conversely, hope predisposes faith and flows from it. St. Barsanufius writes, quote, If you do not believe, neither do you hope. Man can only hope to be healed if he believes in the possibility of being healed if he admits that his condition is not incurable, and if he recognizes Christ as the one who can heal him, whatever his state may be, by having faith in his almighty healing therapy and salvation. Hope is likewise closely linked to repentance, which appears above all as a prerequisite for hope. 
in the observation of his spiritual wretchedness, in the acknowledgement before God of his state of illness, and in the request for the pardon of his sins, which he addresses to God, man is led to hope that Christ will show himself merciful in his regard, and that he will purify and heal him of his spiritual illnesses. Moreover, a man can only hope to be healed if in an attitude of repentance he manifests his willingness to be healed. God cannot heal man against his will and without his active participation in the treatment that the Lord implements. Only in repentance and change of direction can man be sure of his forgiveness and healing. Conversely, hope seems to be the prerequisite of repentance. It is because man hopes in God that he will not remain focused on his past failures or his current pathological state, but believes his healing to be possible, and for this turns to him who can forgive his sins and deliver him from his illnesses, to the one who can give him health and allow him to lead a new life. St. Cyril of Jerusalem notes, quote, The malefactor who does not expect grace sinks into madness, while he who could hope for his forgiveness often comes to the point of conversion. Baptismal Catechesis. Thirdly, hope is linked to prayer. On the one hand, it serves as the prerequisite to prayer. Whoever prays hopes to receive what he is asking for. Yet on the other hand, hope is also a fruit of prayer, especially of the unceasing prayer of the heart. Prayer gives birth to hope, strengthens it, and makes it steadfast. This is true of the prayer of supplication, by which man seeks the gift of this hope. It is also true of the prayer of thanksgiving, by which man preserves in ceaseless memorial the remembrance of God's goodness, and awaits more of it in the future than he has already received in the past, despite his unworthiness. Finally, hope is linked to the keeping of the commandments. On the one hand, this is because the virtue of hope can only exist and be developed in conjunction with the other virtues, and on the basic condition that man be freed from the passions opposing these virtues. For this reason, St. Simeon the New Theologian writes, quote, If one neglects the commandments, one loses hope in God, from his practical Gnostic and theological chapters. Whoever does not do God's will does not guard himself from sin and the passions, and whoever does not conduct himself virtuously cannot hope to be healed and saved. In his commentary on the fourth psalm, St. John Chrysostom points out that David, quote, besides the knowledge of God, prescribes to us a pure life, teaching us this to ground the hope of our salvation, not only on God's goodness, but also on the virtue of our own actions. He says further, quote, after God's mercy, let man place his hope only in the holiness of his life, end of quote. Man can only hope to receive the good things of this kingdom and reign of God in trust on condition that he live according to God in the fulfillment of his holy commandments. It must be stressed that among the virtues, two in particular are conducive to hope, charity and humility. On the other hand, the keeping of the commandments presupposes hope. Generally speaking, hope is one of, the, of man's basic motives for living according to God. It reawakens his zeal, stimulates him, strengthens him, and makes him steadfast in the effort he puts forth to get well and recover his health in Christ by redirecting, through the keeping of the commandments, all the powers of his being toward God, their normal and natural end goal. Whoever hopes for nothing and does not await the health promised by Christ continues to live in his state of sickness, even giving himself over all the more to the passions. On the contrary, the one who hopes for healing acts with this in mind, striving to obtain it every way from the heavenly physician by turning away from evil so as to turn to God at all times with all his being. St. Kirill of Jerusalem remarks, quote, Whoever does not await salvation accumulates evil beyond measure, while he who has conceived the hope of healing treats himself from that moment on. Again, baptismal catechesis. For more on hope, see St. Isaac the Syrian's ascetical homily, number 58, Basil the Great's short rule, number 36, and Isaac the Syrian's ascetical homily, 26. To continue, 
Hope also has many other effects. First of all, one can call to mind the aid it brings to man in the tribulations and difficulties he must face during his earthly existence, particularly by enabling him to endure them patiently, even joyfully. St. John Chrysostom notes, Hope eases the pains here below. He continues, We are supported in our afflictions by unshakable, firm, and eternal hopes from his on afflictions. He points out, quote, The Christian has this advantage, that being supported by the hope of future things, he sets himself above all the ills of this life. In all the trials man encounters, hope constitutes a refuge, even the only one. Hebrews 6.18 In all the trials, if look on, it is a sure and solid anchor for the soul, holding the soul fast to God even in the midst of the most violent tempests. By the same token, it appears as a source of safety and consequently of rest and peace. St. Isaac the Syrian writes on this subject from ascetical homily 58, quote, Whatever be the paths men tread in this world, they find there no peace, since they do not draw near to the hope of God. Far from pains and obstacles, the heart is not at peace, since it has not attained hope. But when the heart has found it, hope calms it, fills it with joy. End of quote. Hope also helps man to bear patiently the pangs of ascetic labors whose fruits do not issue forth immediately, and which on account of this offer ground favorable to disheartenment. St. Macarius the Great writes, quote, Unless a person keeps hope before his eyes, saying namely, I shall obtain salvation in life, he cannot bear afflictions or burdens patiently, or accept to travel along the narrow road. For it is the presence of hope that allows him to labor and bear afflictions. St. John Chrysostom points out, Quote, hope is a solid chain, fixed in and suspended from the heavens, which supports our souls during the crossing, gradually hoists up to this height those who have attached themselves firmly to it, and lifts us up from the tumult of earthly misfortunes. End of quote. From his exhortations to Theodore 1.2. To continue. From hope, man draws the confidence and the assurance needed in order to fight the good fight. Hope furthermore allows man to escape doubt and unhealthy, a splitting, a dysychia. For this reason, St. Mark the ascetic calls it simple or monological hope. But the therapeutic effects of this virtue are not limited to this. St. Gregory Nazazine says, hope is a cure in illnesses. This is true of both bodily and spiritual illnesses. Footnote, thus St. Barsanufius writes, quote, if, a we if a weakness or other illness should come upon you, cast your hope on your master, and you will be comforted. Of quote. Hope appears, first of all, to be the cure specifically adapted to the passions opposed to it. As St. John Chrysostom says, it is, quote, the antidote to despair especially for the sort of man the sort the man feels when faced with his state of sickness and sin Quote, there is a despair that is the consequence of a multitude of sins of a burdened conscience and unbearable sorrow because the soul is covered with a multitude of wounds and sinks under the burden of them into the depths of despair that despair is cured by good hope latter step 26 189 to continue even more so hope heals man of sadness an extreme form of which is despair as we've seen a saying of the holy fathers in the desert relates that an ascetic quote beholding himself conquered by sadness being such an experienced physician gave himself good hope and said i trust in god's mercies and i know that he will surely have mercy on me sadness also leads to acedia which is close to these two latter passions. St. John Climacus remarks, A good monk, a monk of good hope, is a slayer of despondency, acedia, listlessness, neglect. With this sword, he routs it. Latter, step 30. 
Hope likewise allows one to escape anguish. This virtue also plays a fundamental role in the healing of all other spiritual illnesses. St. Mark the Ascetic stresses that it contributes to the rejecting of passionate thoughts and desires from the heart. Generally speaking, it encourages man to purify himself of all evil so as to attain the good things for which he hopes and to be worthy of uniting himself to him in whom he hopes. St. John writes, 1 John 3.3, 3, Everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. Hope is one of the general conditions for man's spiritual healing, since through hope man turns to the heavenly physician and attaches himself to his word, quote, the promises of which heal the wounds of our sins. Thus Evagrius can go so far as to say that from hope and perseverance is born dispassion. Hope possesses not only a therapeutic, but also a preventative function. As the Holy Apostle says, it is a helmet that covers and protects the head of the spiritual man. St. John Cassian's conferences. It preserves him from a falls. According to the psalmist's word, none of those that hope in God shall go wrong. Hope protects man from the attacks of the demons. St. Peter Damascene notes, quote, When the enemies humiliate him before God, he lifts himself up by hope in order never to fall by yielding to tumult and never losing hope under fear. In a general way, it closes the entrance into the heart to all the vices. At the same time, that hope is one of the conditions for the healing of the passions and keeps man from falling back into them. It is also one of the sources for acquiring the virtues. See St. Mark the Ascetic on those who think they are made righteous by works and on the spiritual law in the Philokalia. Dr. Elisha continues to, and concludes chapter 3. Most importantly, one must stress the close relationship that hope maintains with the highest of the virtues containing all the others, love, charity. If, as we have seen, hope flows from charity, conversely, hope is the condition for charity. St. Simeon, the new theologian, teaches that man, having acquired hope, can possess, quote, holy in it love toward God. For it is impossible for any man to acquire perfect love toward God and other than through sincere faith and a firm and unshakable hope. St. John Climacus similarly notes, quote, the failing of hope is the disappearance of love. Step 30. Conversely, the power of love is in hope. St. Diodokos of Photiki defines hope as the flight of the noose in love toward that for which it hopes. Indeed, when man has hope, he already attains in some way the goal to which hope raises him. In hope, he receives to a certain extent and through anticipation the good things with which this virtue is concerned. For this reason, St. John Climacus writes, quote, hope is a wealth of hidden riches. And again, hope is is a treasure of assurance of the treasure in store for us. This is why spiritual joy, the first fruits of the awaited blessedness, is attached to hope. End of chapter 3. The general conditions of therapy and the subjective conditions for healing and health. Chapter 4. The process of healing. Inner conversion. It must be borne in mind that for man, virtue is not to be acquired as a new and foreign reality external to him. St. Maximus the Confessor points out it, that it is not a matter of adding the virtues from the outside and as something additional. And St. John Damascene says that it is not a question of acquiring virtue, though it were something that came from without. St. Anthony the Great likewise states, quote, It is not far from us. It is not formed outside us. The work is in us. Virtue needs only our goodwill, since it is in us and is formed in us. From his life of Anthony, Athanasius the Great. As we've seen, the virtues are const constitutive of man's very nature. God placed them in him from the beginning when he created him in his likeness. This state, which man lost following the first sin, has been restored by Christ 
and every baptized and chrismated person regains the state. However, if man gives in to sin and abandons himself to the passions, the virtues do not cease to define his true nature on that account. Rather, it is the passions that are foreign to this nature, that come from the outside, are added to it, conceal it, and feed on it like parasites. The passions are to virtuous nature as rust is to iron, Saints Maximus and John Damascene note. Furthermore, to borrow another comparison from St. Gregory of Nyssa, that great author of the Treatise on Virginity and the Angelic Life and the Door to the Kingdom, says that, there's, that the soiled garment covering the man who has fallen into the mire of sin and which hides but does not destroy his natural beauty, on Virginity chapter 12. Having recourse to the notions of sickness and health allows us to understand things even better, since we have seen that the virtues are the health of the soul, and the passions are its illnesses. One must take care to observe the phenomenological order. For the soul, as for the body, health is first, normal, and constitutive of his nature, whereas illness comes later and is introduced as a foreign and disruptive element. Evagrius the Solitary stresses this, quote, if death is second in relation to life, and illness second in relation to health, clearly vice is also second to virtue. Gnostic chapter 1.41. St. Isaac the Syrian likewise points out, quote, virtue is naturally the soul's health. The passions are its illness. It is clear that health exists in nature before the eruption of illness. If this is really so, and this is the very truth, then virtue is naturally in the soul, and what comes afterwards is outside nature. Seneca Homily 83. Additionally, as St. Dorotheus of Gaza teaches, to live according to virtue is quite simply, quote, to recover one's proper state, to return to health just as one recovers normal sight after an ocular illness or one's proper and natural health after any other illness. End of quote. In studying the pathology of fallen man, we have seen how the passions, sicknesses of the soul, are formed by a perversion of man's nature, more precisely, by a deviation of all his faculties, which originally and naturally were turned to God, their normal end goal, but which through sin turned away from him to be contra-naturally and irrationally oriented towards sensible realities, i.e. fallen logic. Hence, it is clear that for man, a return to health will consist in recovering his original nature by effecting the reverse movement, i.e. by turning his faculties away from carnal realities so as to turn them again toward God. By this one understands that the Holy Scriptures and all of tradition call to mind salvation and defined its conditions in terms of conversion in the etymological sense of the word, that of returning, of changing one's direction. Footnote, to look at the root terms for repentance and metanya, the most frequently used terms are literally to turn, to turn the opposite direction, to return, to turn towards, to direct towards, to turn the opposite direction, to retrace one's steps, to come back to oneself, to turn away from, to return. The action of turning oneself or returning. The term for matanya signifies a change of mentality or feelings, are also used often but focus rather on the inner attitude of repentance which must govern this change, or at least is the condition for it, instead of around the change itself from an objective point of view. Repent, therefore, and turn again, in Acts 3.19. To continue, For just as sin and in general evil consist for man in distancing oneself from God by turning away from him, salvation and in general good consist conversely in drawing close to God by turning back to him with all one's being. St. Irenaeus clearly considers the prerequisite for man's healing to lie in this very returning. Quote, the Lord himself testifies that he has come to those who are ill. How then will they who fare poorly recover? Is it by persevering in the same tendencies? Is it not on the contrary by accepting a profound change and return from their former way of life 
by which they have brought upon themselves an unusual illness of numerous sins against all heresies. The human faculties were created by God with the good in mind, and by nature they are oriented towards spiritual good things. Man can maintain them in this orientation by virtue of the freedom at his disposal, and thus use them in a normal fashion, in conformity with their nature, reasonably and virtuously. Side note, see the life of the Cenobiums and the Holy Monasteries. However, by turning them toward false, sensible goods, he can use them wrongly, pathologically, contranaturally, in an un unreasonable and passionate manner. We recall this once more to underscore that the virtues and the passions are defined by how man uses his faculties and by the goal toward which he directs them. St. Maximus writes, quote, For according to whether we use things rightly or wrongly, we become either good or bad. As for St. Simeon the New Theologian, he points out that the soul becomes wicked if it adheres to evil, and conversely good if it adheres to to the good. And St. John Chrysostom notes that it thus depends on us to make our members serve sin or righteousness. Footnote from Clement of Alexandria. Everything that is contrary to the right logos is sin. Accordingly, therefore, the philosophers think it fit to define the most generic passions. However, Virtue itself is a state of soul rendered harmonious by the Logos in respect to the whole life. For the life of the Christians is a system of actions in conformity with the Logos. From Pedagogue. To continue. Quote, Nothing created and given existence by God is evil, St. Maximus states clearly, so as to stress that the faculties themselves are not at fault, but rather the manner of their use. He explains, quote, When we misuse the soul's powers, their evil aspects dominate us. The misuse of our power of intelligence results in ignorance and stupidity. The misuse of our insensitive power and our desirative power produces hatred and licentiousness. The proper use of these powers produces the virtues. St. Basil likewise explains that the powers of the soul become the instruments of vice or virtue according to the different tendencies of the man who is acting. If he makes use of the desirative faculty, so as to plunge himself into sensual pleasures, he will make himself loathsome and abominable. On the other hand, if he uses it so as to become inflamed with the love of God and of our Savior Jesus Christ, all his desires will be virtuous, and he will merit eternal blessedness. Quote, if you use anger well and make use of it with reason, it will be changed into strength, patience, and steadfastness. But if you misuse it, it will turn into fury and frenzy. St. Basil's homily on anger. The same rationale applies to the rational faculty. When one uses it well, one becomes wise and prudent. But if one uses one's reason so as to harm one's neighbor, one becomes crafty, deceitful, and wicked. In the virtues, as in the passions, the same organs, powers, and faculties are then at work. Virtue corresponds to the healthy use of these in conformity with their natural and end goal, being oriented toward God. Passion corresponds to their perverted and pathological use, to their orientation toward a goal not in conformity with their nature, and consisting of a sensible or carnal reality. For this reason, the transition from the passions to the virtues does not imply a non-usage, mortification, or even destruction of these very organs, powers, or faculties. Rather, it consists in their reorientation, their conversion, so to speak, in their turning away again toward their natural and original object that is, the spiritual realities, the good, God. Thus, St. Nikitas Stathatos says clearly, we must, through the labor of matanya, of repentance and assiduous ascetic practice, restore the soul's powers to the state they had when God originally formed Adam. St. Maximus, for his part, explains that corrupted man readily succumbs, in a sense, to the body's passion, fantasies, and impulses. But when he is regenerated, 
He studies how to rectify such impulses. He says further, quote, from his questions to Thalassius, Fervent men make use of these passions, certainly not of these passions as such, but of the energy, the power, that serves as their foundation. On the one hand, so as to cause evil, present or future, to disappear. And on the other hand, so as to acquire and hold on to virtue and knowledge, taking as an example the learned physicians who transform the very venom of the viper into medicine. In conclusion, the passions become good by reason of their use for him who knows how to submit all his thoughts and will in obedience to Christ. Quote. Hence one can say with, with the saints Callistos and Ignatius, Santhopoul, that, quote, the perfect soul is the one whose passionate power is totally directed toward God. The apostle himself summons the baptized to such a conversion to God of all their faculties, by which conversion the latter regain the virtuous order of their nature. Quote from Romans 6, verse 13, do not yield your members to sin as instruments of wickedness, but yield yourself to God as men who have been brought from death to life, and your members to God as instruments of righteousness. And from Romans six nineteen, For just as you once yielded your members to impurity and to greater and greater iniquity, so now yield your members to righteousness for sanctification. We have seen that sin consists in the first place of unawareness of God. Man's turning his cognitive faculties away from God so as to turn them toward the sensible world and subordinate them to the senses alone, thus giving birth to fantastical and delirious forms of knowledge, a pale substitute for true knowledge. The cognitive organs returned to their original health is brought about by the inverse movement i.e. by turning away from sensible realities so as to be oriented anew toward God. St. Athanasius the Great writes, quote, For men were able as they turned away their understanding from God and imagined as gods things that were not, in like manner to ascend with the intelligence of their soul and turn back to God again against the pagans. And St. Maximus advises, quote, By reason... Rather than ignorance, we must set about seeking God alone on the path of knowledge. The cognitive organs are thus in no wise modified in their nature, but merely reoriented in their activity, for they are healthy or sick only in function of their orientation. Quote, through the intellect, we become worse. Quote, but also, through the intellect, we become better. St. Isaac the Syrian points out in Ascetical Homily 49, speaking of the noose. He subsequently notes that when, quote, God wants, God wants is a transformation of our noose, for such a change alone can go before God. And St. Gregory of Nyssa observes that we regain the good of God, quote, every time that we bring our reasoning back to him. It is simply a matter of leading the cognitive organs to exercise themselves in accordance with the normal end goal that corresponds to their nature. St. Anthony also says, quote, If the soul keeps its intelligent part in conformity with nature, virtue is formed. It is in accordance with nature when it remains as it was made, for it was made beautiful and upright. For the soul to be upright is to have the, in the intellect of the noose act according to nature as it was made. But when it deviates and distorts itself in relation to nature, then one speaks of the soul's vice. The matter is not difficult. Then, if we remain such as we were made, we are in virtue. End of quote from Athanasios the Great's Life of St. Anthony. To continue, Dr. Larcher writes, The soul's rational part thus needs not be mortified or stifled, otherwise man would no longer have any means to contemplate spiritual realities and for knowing God. Rather, it must merely be used differently. This part of the soul regains its true life. St. Gregory Palamas notes, by helping man again, quote, to consecrate himself to divine contemplation and to address hymns of thanksgiving unto God. The soul's rational part is not the only one that is improved by, the, by being redirected toward its original, normal, and natural end goal. All the other faculties are as well, and this occurs under the mind's direction. 
St. Gregory Palamas writes, quote, By the mind's authority, we establish the law for each of the soul's power, powers and what is fitting for each of the bodily members, Gregory Palamas triads. The desirative and irascible powers, whose perversion lies at the heart of a good number of troubles and is the source of nearly all the spiritual illnesses, which are the passions, can thus become healthy again under the direction of the noose and reason, which themselves are reoriented toward God by being turned back toward their original and natural end goal. This end goal is the first place is to desire and love God, and in the second to fight against evil with the good in mind, that is, against everything striving to distance man from God, and to acquire and hold on to all that allows man to draw near to and be united to him. St. Maximus writes, quote, It is possible to make the logos the basis of the soul's irrational faculties, I mean the irascible and desirative, and to bring them into harmony with the mind through reason. After recalling that man's irrational movements are transformed into vices by the misuse of the noose, St. Gregory of Nyssa similarly notes that, quote, conversely, if the reason imp imposes its dominion over its movements, it gives to each of them the form of virtue. He notes further, all these movements directed on high by the mind's superior activity become conformable to the beauty of the divine image from on the making of man. Origen likewise says that anger, desire, and everything similar that can be experienced are good or bad according to the rational or irrational use one makes of them, and that we must thus endeavor to acquire the mind of Christ, so as to transform with God in mind what he has given us. Here again, the return to health does not come about by an inhibiting or a mortification of the faculties at fault but by a change in their use, by their reorientation toward God under the mind's leadership. St. Gregory Palamas explains quite categorically that the therapy, quote, does not consist of causing the impassioned part to die, but of reorientating it from evil to good, of directing it in its very constitution toward divine things after completely turning it away from evil and having turned it to the good. Indeed, it is with that faculty of the soul that we love and turn ourselves away, that we are united or remain strangers. Those who love the good thus affect a transposition of this faculty and do not cause it to die. They do not enclose it within themselves without allowing it any movement, but cause it to act in love toward God and neighbor. The man who is healed of spiritual illnesses is henceforth he who has subjected his irascible and concupiscible appetites, the two of which constitute the soul's impassioned part, to the cognitive faculties, judgment, and reasoning of this same soul, just as impassioned people subject their reason to the passions. In this way, one will practice the corresponding virtues with the impassioned part of the soul, which will act in conformity with the goal set before it by God when he created it. In other words, it is allowed to function healthily again. If man were to inhibit, mortify, and destroy the impassioned part of his soul, he would deprive himself of the faculties and energies which alone can allow him to turn away from the evil and toward God. St. Gregory Palamas notes, There would be in him no movement or action for acquiring a divine state, relations with God, and divinized mental tendencies. End of quote. By subjecting this impassioned part, he will be able, on the other hand, to use it to pursue the noose's ends, to go as is fitting to God and yearn for God. He writes further, Men who have a passion for the beautiful do not cause the impassioned part of their soul to die by closing it within themselves and leaving it without activity. For then they would no longer possess the necessary organ for loving good and hating evil. They would no longer have the means to become strangers to evil so as to be united to God. This is what they cause to die, the relations of this power with wicked things. They direct the power entirely toward love of God in conformity with the first and great commandment. You shall love the Lord your God with all your strength. 
Mark 12, 30. That is to say, with all your power. What power? The power of the impassioned part, of course. From this, it is clear that man's desire and love for God are fulfilled by no other faculty or energy than those through which man desires and loves carnal realities. Thus, Theodore et of Cyrus writes, The desirative appetite has great advantages. Due to it, we desire divine things. We passionately desire to see the Lord who is in the heaven. We tend toward virtue. And meanwhile, we continue to live our life, taking food and drink. Furthermore, thanks to it, the human race increases by means of procreation. From his therapy of Hellenic illnesses. To continue, what changes between the two kinds of desires is merely the orientation given to the single power which is their source. Stressing this unity, St. Maximus the Confessor does not hesitate to use the same term of passion to signify at once carnal love and charity, simply saying that the passion of love, when reprehensible, occupies the noose with material things, but when rightly directed, unites it with the divine. Four centuries on love. Thus the desire for good comes to be nourished by the very energy of passionate desires, by the very power of lust. St. Maximus writes, When a man's intellect is constantly with God, his desire grows beyond all measure into an intense longing for God. He further notes, The soul makes use of its concupiscence, so as to maintain its desire. Consequently, he formulates this wish, would that the power of concupiscence fight so as to desire God. Elsewhere, he advises, the desirative power, pure of the passion of self-love, must direct all its desire toward God alone. Evagrius similarly notes that the desirative power must be entirely inclined toward the Lord. St. Gregory of Nyssa, on his part, calling to mind the passion of avarice, writes, quote, The love of gain, which is a large, incalculably large element in every soul, when once applied to the desire for God, will bless the man who has it. And we have seen St. Basil write on his homily on anger, If man uses his desirative faculty so as to plunge himself into sensual pleasures, he will make himself loathsome and abominable. On the other hand, if he uses it so as to become inflamed with the love of God and of our Savior Jesus Christ, all his desires will be virtuous, and he will merit eternal blessedness. If it is vital that one must not mortify, kill, or even inhibit the desire of power, this is because it is not only the faculty that God, that allows us to love God, but also, generally speaking, it is the mainspring of the whole spiritual life, the driving force behind the return to God under the noose direction of all men's faculties and activities. Thus, St. Gregory of Nyssa writes, quote, Desire is an excellent beast of burden, carrying the soul on its back and leading it up to the heights, when directed to the good things on high by the reins of reason. And St. Maximus thus makes clear his aforementioned wish, May the mind of the noose order itself entirely with God as its goal, burning with sensual affectation by the extreme desire of concupiscence. Commentary on the Lord's Prayer. If the desirative power possesses such might, it is because all the faculties are connected to it to some degree, but also because when this power regains its natural orientation toward God and takes the form of charity, true love, the latter constitutes, together with knowledge, the organizing and life-giving center of the spiritual life. With this in mind, St. Gregory Palamas writes, quote, Thus disposed to loving God, this loving part raises the other powers of the soul above earthly things and turn, turns them toward God. It is also clear that by conversion, by the reorientation of the desire of power, the carnal passion becomes spiritual passion. In other words, virtue. It withdraws its energy from the sensible objects to which it had given itself over pathologically in order to reinvest it in the divine objects shown to it by the mind. St. Maximus thus explains that 
when a man's noose is constantly with God, and when it has reintegrated its passable aspect, he fills it with an incomprehensible and intense longing for him, and with increasing love, thus drawing it entirely away from worldly things to the divine. He notes further, In fervent men, even the passions become good, when these men wisely detach themselves from corporal objects so as to transpose them to the acquisition of heavenly goods. For example, they transform the passion of desire into a spiritual movement which raises them up and causes them to long for divine things. St. Gregory of Nyssa describes the same process. The soul will transfer all its powers of affectation from material objects to the intellectual contemplation of immaterial beauty and virginity. St. John Climacus likewise observes, our pleasure-loving dispositions attain to love of God. He also gives this teaching, those who aim at ascending with the body to heaven indeed need violence and constant suffering until our pleasure-loving dispositions and unfeeling hearts attain to the love of God. Step 1. From this same perspective, he speaks of him who expels fleshly love with divine love. And in order to show that such a transformation encompasses the most passionate, the most sensual forms of love, even the most degraded, he presents this testimony. Quote, I have seen impure souls raving madly about physical love, but making their experience of such love a reason for repentance. They transferred the same love to the Lord. The conversion of the desirative power is accompanied by a change in the corresponding form of pleasure, since the nature of the object of desire has changed. Sensual pleasure gives way to spiritual delight. Man then knows again the blessedness for which he is created by virtue of his very nature, and which Adam experienced before his fall in paradise. St. Maximus thus notes that virtuous men, at the same time as converting the passion of desire into a spiritual movement toward divine realities, quote, transforms pleasure into the healthy rejoicing of the noose's vol volitional energy before the divine charismata, from his questions to Thalassius. And St. Gregory of Nyssa similarly remarks, when the reason exerts its hegemony, the impetus of desire procures for us a divine and unadulterated pleasure on the soul and the resurrection. And we have seen St. Basil, the great state that if man, instead of using his desirative faculty to plunge himself into sensual pleasures, makes use of it to love God, he will merit eternal blessedness. The second essential component of the soul's passionate part, the aggressive or irascible power likewise regains its full health by being converted under the direction of the mind, the noose, and that of reason. Having become ill on account of being turned away from its natural function by sin, and having been used in a perverse manner to reject God and to hate one's neighbor, at the same time as it being used to fight for the acquisition and preservation of false sensible goods, this power returns to full health by serving again in conformity with its original end goal to combat all forms of evil. In other words, it fights against everything that aims at distancing the soul from God and battles for the acquisition and preservation of spiritual goods. Here again, the virtuous man does not use a different faculty than the passionate man. Truly, the same irascible, aggressive power is at work. But while the latter uses it for a carnal end, the former uses it for a spiritual end, namely, lovingly to defend the divine object of its searchings and to become a stranger to evil so as to be united himself to God. Thus St. Maximus advises, the aggressive irascible power, freed from tyranny, must undertake to fight for God alone. In this sense, aggression pursues the same goal as love and charity while simultaneously serving it. St. Maximus points out, when a man's noose is constantly with God, even his 
insensiveness is completely transformed into divine love. In this case as well, virtue does not consist of inhibiting, mortifying, or eliminating the irascible power, for man would thus be deprived of the means of combat, which, as we shall later see, are indispensable for his spiritual life, at all levels of which life he encounters so many adverse powers. At the same time, he would be cut off from an energy that, together with that of the desired of power, constitutes an absolutely necessary driving force behind this very spiritual life. St. Basil the Great thus points out, quote, We will never have the loathing for sin that we ought to if we are not animated by the indignation of anger. Quote, Noting further that it serves the soul as energy, inspiring it with strength, courage, and steadfastness, and seeing its undertaking through to the end, it gives vigor and firmness to the mind. For this reason, he concludes, when the irascible power is subject to reason, one must love it, just as one must hate it when it is irrational. St. Diodocus of Photiki, on his part, contrasts this power with spiritual inertia, a pathological and paradoxically passionate state. Quote, he then who through zeal for religion uses anger wisely, will doubtless be found worthier on the scale of recompense than he who through inertia has never been moved to anger. Thanks to the help of the irascible power, all the faculties, and first of all the desirative power, are able to achieve their goal, which is union with God. St. Maximus also formulates this wish, quote, May the power of aggression fight for God, or rather to speak properly. May the whole mind order itself with God in mind, held taut by the mode of aggression like a rope. All man's faculties and powers, both mentally and bodily ones alike, regain their normal and healthy use by the same process of conversion, being turned away from their pathological orientation toward carnal objects so as to be oriented toward their natural divine and spiritual goal. Among these faculties and powers, we can mention the memory, which, having through sin, become the memory of evil and the remembrance of sensible and carnal realities and objects, finds health again in becoming, as in the beginning, the memory of God. We can likewise mention the important feelings of sadness and fear, the first having become a passion for starting to lament the loss of sensible goods, the frustration of all our passionate desires becomes a virtue again by being redirected toward a spiritual goal and by being used to weep over the loss of spiritual goods, to sorrow over sins in repentance and compunction. The second having become a passion for starting to dread the loss of sensible things becomes anew the virtue of fearing God by being redirected toward the spiritual goal appropriate to its nature. The same may be said of all the other feelings, tendencies, movements, and energies of the soul, but also of every member of the body that passes from passion to virtue by the mind's authority in being turned in its usage toward God. The work of virtue must not be to aggravate the body, quote, for the body is not a bad thing, Rather, it must turn the body away from committing sin in order to return it to its normal function of being a temple of the Holy Spirit. Man is able to bring about this conversion of his whole being, this genuine turning back to God of all his faculties, this transmutation of the passions into virtues, and thus regain health in the whole of the theanthropic life of asceticism, which the Holy Fathers call praxis. After the presenting the general conditions, we shall now examine in detail the modalities of this transmutation in which man receives spiritual healing from God, its implementation. For as St. Maximus says, it is necessary to ponder and study with vigilance how the soul shall properly make the good turn back, if so as to attain the birth and reality of the virtues. It makes use of the things through which it was formerly in error. End of part three.